Welcome. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, Jan I'm sorry, February 6th, 2023. I am Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Steve Zakorski? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Cooler? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. Ashley Meyer? Yes. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, it is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the NOVA agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So let's see how much of the town's business we can get done this evening. It seems to be a long agenda. Next on the agenda uh, is the land acknowledgement. I would like to read the land acknowledgement that the board supported in the spring of 2021 and that was adopted at the 2021 annual town meeting. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We now welcome Chief Flaherty and her statement regarding Tyree Nichols. Chief. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to come in front of you tonight. Um, a little over a week ago, the Memphis Police Department released a very disturbing video um, in which several members of the Memphis Police Department brutally beat um, Tyree Nichols. Um, and in response to that, I issued a statement to the community that I'd like to share with you tonight. After viewing the video released involving Tyree Nichols and five former members of the Memphis Police Department, I am appalled, saddened, and disturbed by the actions of the former officers involved. The Arlington Police Department stands with our community in denouncing the brutality that was suffered by Mr. Nichols. There is no room for policing. There is no room in policing for this lack of humanity. The women and men of the Arlington Police Department are committed to fair and impartial policing and to treating everyone that we interact with with dignity and respect. As professionals, we are obligated to de-escalate situations, to intervene when needed, and to keep our community members safe. We will continue to work with our community to help bring us together. The women and the men of the Arlington Police Department extend our condolences to the loved ones of Mr. Nichols. So I issued that statement to the community, but I'd also like to say that um, the members of the police department um, were aware and we acknowledge the history of policing in the United States, and we work every day towards making the police department better to be better police officers. Um, here in Arlington, our officers train regularly. I know I come before you often and talk about the different trainings that we do. Um, we've recently conducted trainings in procedural justice. Um, we've participated in several workshops um, on implicit bias, hate crimes, and DEI. Um, as you all know, we're an accredited police department, which means that um, our policies, our procedures, and practices are in line with 21st century policing. Um, recently, the Attorney General's Office approved Warrant Article 16 um, from town meeting, which is they approved the commission, um, the police um, advisory commission, and we're very much looking forward to working with members. I understand that recruitment is underway now to fill those commission seats. Um, we are looking forward to working with the commission, and we're eager to get started in the very important work of um, of um, moving the police department forward, improving our transparency, and um, just making the police department a better place to work and uh, making Arlington a better place to live in the community. Thank you, Chief. And so, do any of my colleagues want to say anything? Okay. Um, 
Mr. Pollard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, commend Chief Flaherty for taking the initiative to put out this statement. Uh, I think it was an important statement for the chief to make, and um, it certainly reflects uh, the town of Arlington's commitment to having a good uh, community policing type department. Arlington does not have any of the type of squad, the so-called Scorpion squad that the uh, city of Memphis has. Um, we run a different kind of police department here, and I'm very proud of the work that the department does and the Chief Flaherty does to uphold uh, the kind of values that we cherish here in Arlington, respect for life and respect for every member of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, um, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief Flaherty and Mr. Pooler. Uh, I remember our first meeting, Chief, you said to me that the ethos of the department that you lead is to be guardians and not warriors. Correct. And that's stuck with me. And I think I see that play out uh, every day in your leadership and that of your leadership team and your officers. And we are very fortunate and very grateful because those values and that tone comes from the top. And I know that you set that expectation and that example every day. Thank you for being proactive in issuing a local response to these terrible, this terrible event in, in Memphis. And I join with you in hoping that policing in America changes. Thank you. Mr. Herrick. Thank you, and thank you for the statement. I echo the comments of my colleagues and the town manager. And I mean, it is certainly saddening that to, that so many times we have to come together and have these conversations because of terrible events that happen across the country that continue to happen even as people stand up to injustice. But it is a reminder and I do think it, it's important for people in Arlington to acknowledge the incredible work of the Arlington Police Department. And we always throw around the term community policing. And I look at the police department and the officers I know, and it's amazing how many officers of the Arlington Police Department grew up in Arlington. There's, I often say there's police officers or firefighters who, he was on my baseball team, he was on my hockey team, he coached me. He was an umpire when I was in Little League. And it really, is, and certainly no offense to the amazing officers that have come from other municipalities, but it really is a police department that's made up of officers from this community who care about the community, care about the people in the community and the values of the community of Arlington. And it's really f reflected in the work that you do as chief and the officers do below you and it real and it makes me proud to when I see policing in other areas to see how we police in Arlington and it really should be commended it, and I think a little more than it do, does get commended so thank you thank you for your statement thank you for the acknowledgement and uh, thank you for everything that you do thank you Thanks for starting. All right, I'm not seeing the other hand. I'll just say thank you, Chief, for being on, for coming in. And, and yeah, so I kind of want the lines of Mr. Hart being in. I, um, I've gotten to know a number of uh, officers you know, through, through the gym, you know, and, and, and I got, to, uh, got a good sense of the character even before I knew that they were police officers. In, and, and, and we, you know, and, and long before I got, uh, became a member of the board, I mean, and so, so you kind of get to know people when you see them regularly at the gym, you get a sense of, of, of their character, you know, um, and, and yeah, you don't know everything, but you know, you, you, you know when you feel comfortable with people, you know, and, and so, yeah, I've always felt really comfortable with um, members of uh, APD, you know, and, and so, I mean, partly whenever things like this happen, you feel badly uh, for uh, people in certain sectors because you know that they, they get tainted with it, and, and so um, I, I just really wanted a chance for you to let the community know what we do here in Arlington, you know, to provide, you know, for for safe, you know, policing, protective policing, and as Mr. Elman said, that um, uh, Arlington 
police department are guardians of warden warriors. And I can also say from my work with you on the Rainbow Commission being that you're held in really high esteem in, uh, in, in many areas of the community. And I also know from the work that was done for the police civilian, I'm sorry, police civilian advisory board study committee, you know, that uh, you and the department is held in high regard. And it makes me even happier that we have done the work being to create that police civilian advisory board. Because I think had we not, being, and we were here now, we would be wishing you know, that we had kind of gone down that road, but we have, meaning we're getting ready to, um, to um, populate it. And, and I think we, um, hopefully there won't be other events like this, but that will probably be the place that the community turns me for, for some insights as to what you know, our police department is doing. So thank you once again for taking the time to, um, to join us and take care. Thank you. Thank you all. So next on the agenda, uh, we have the approval of sale of $190,000 in sewer bond dated February 27th, 2023 to the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority for inflow and infiltration local financial assistance program. We have um, Mr. Fowler, interim town, man, town treasurer. Yes, nice to meet you all. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. This is day three on the job, so. <laughs> Um, this is to approve a $190,000 bond issue that was approved at town meeting. A copy was included in your packet. Along with that, there's a $570,000 grant that goes with it for a total estimated project cost of $760,000 for water and sewer infiltration work within the town of Sharon. Um, Arlington. The, <laughs> the nice thing is it's an interest-free loan and a grant. If any, I don't know if anybody has any further questions or. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Welcome. Thank you. No questions. <laughs> Move approval. <laughs> we'll make this one easy for you. And I wanted to point out, Ashley was terrific. She put up with me on Friday. There were 10 pages of this missing. She helped me put this whole thing together so we made it on the agenda. So I wanted to publicly thank her. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to second it and just very briefly digress just a bit. Um, I, I welcome Mr. Fowler. Thank you. Appreciate um, you coming into the treasurer's office. And I want to thank our town manager, Mr. Pooler, as well as our town treasurer, Mr. Fowler, on a completely separate issue, uh, first week on the job regarding the parking meters um, out front. Yes. That, uh, a lot of residents were very concerned about. And I do appreciate the fact that the two of you and perhaps other staff met, met so promptly, discussed the issue, um, and not only came up with a solution, but also made sure you got it out to the proper venues and town website, et cetera. Um, so I, I do appreciate that. I'll, other I, one of my staff, Sue's in, pitched in, and I would like to, oh, the chief's gone. I was going to thank uh, Corey at the uh, police department, who was terrific. I spent about an hour with him on the phone. We worked out a game plan. I grabbed Sandy, and within 15 minutes, the few meters that were still working, they were outside shutting them off. They were all shut off before I left. So everybody pitched in and got it done fairly quickly. Thank you. And I, I just have one request, and I, I talked briefly to the town manager about it. Um, something that m maybe it wasn't new and I just never paid attention, but it's my understanding that um, when someone wants to appeal a ticket, there's a $5 yes. charge. Could you look into that and, and let us know or let the town manager know to let us know if that is a new thing um, and I, do we really need that? I don't believe it's new, but I, I did question my first day here when parking meters, day one of the job, we got two complaints. The next day, there were like four. It was incremental. I figured by today, we'd be inundated with them. They're, my belief, and I would defer to town council, but I believe the charge, the $5 charge is probably not appropriate according to prior rulings I've got from DOR and similar issues. So if you could, uh, and I'll work with the town manager, yeah. you know, I'd like to get rid of that if it's not. Just, we're, we're so vigilant in terms of when we set fees, um, 
for other things that the select board does. So message delivered, yeah. and that has nothing to do with you because you're day three on the job, but it really was a thank you for acting so promptly on that. So thank well, you. And I, I, the residents were great too. This started with a phone call from a resident who was upset but very polite, and she actually gave me enough information that I could piece the rest of it together. So it really was a group effort. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to digress. No problem. You're welcome. You know, so, so on a uh, motion to approve the sale of the bonds by Mr. Well, first off, let me check to see if other colleagues have anything they want to say or ask. Okay, looks like we're all set. Me. So, on a motion to approve by uh, the sale of bonds made uh, for one hundred nine thousand dollars by Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Mahan. Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yeah, Yamas. Great. Thank you. Moving on. Item number five, um, fiscal year 2024, town manager's budget presentation. We now turn it to town manager, Mr. Kohler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is, I'm just going to wait till the slides. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Ashley. Um, just an overview of what I want to talk about. Um, talk about the general fund. Uh, and how it fits in with a long-range plan and what we do and do not know about our long-range plan at this point, what major changes and minor changes there are in the town's general fund budget, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, FTEs in the budget. Uh, I'll then quickly go over the enterprise funds, uh, very quickly go over capital, uh, and then talk a little bit about some ongoing issues. Um, so what you have in front of you on the screen now is the town's long-range plan as presented in the manager's budget that was presented to you members of the board and to the finance committee for consideration in preparation of the finance committee's uh, report that will go to town meeting. It's the finance committee's report that uh, town meeting will vote on. Um, and uh, so this is a preliminary look at the budget as of February 15th. You can see that there is a $2.6 million deficit projected for FY25. Um, if that deficit stays in place, um, it would mean uh, that we uh, would probably need an override this coming spring. However, that's not the end of that story. I will say more about that in a second. Um, Ashley, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, within the overall budget, there are some things we know. We know, for example, that this year the town budget uh, is going up 3.5 percent. I want to talk about that for just one second. Usually the town budget goes up 3.25 percent, uh, but because of differences in the way that we collect money for, for our ambulance services, where in the past about half of that money went into the ambulance revolving fund and half went into the general fund, and now almost all of it goes into the general fund because of some changes that the fire department and Armstrong made in their billing arrangements and services. Uh, it meant that uh, the town budget lost uh, a little more than $100,000 in, um, in offsets. Uh, those offsets usually help keep our increase down to 3.25%. So we lost the offsets, but we gained more revenue in the general fund. And so accordingly, I've raised the town budget another quarter percent. Essentially, <coughs> excuse me, to account for an accounting change and uh, not have to make cuts in town services. Uh, the school budget overall is going up 5.3%. Capital will remain 5% of the overall budget. Our pension assessment is uh, increasing 5.7%, and we are using $357,092 of ARPA funds for various one-time positions, uh, positions that are here in the budget only as long as we have ARPA funds. There are unknown things, uh, one of the biggest of which is the Minuteman assessment. Uh, it's a 12.5% increase in the Minuteman assessment um, this is partially due, as I've looked more into this, uh, due to uh, the fact that Arlington 
has the largest number of students at Minuteman and um, has been rising over the last few years. Although as I looked at it more, actually that part of the assessment is actually comparative to last year uh, gone down slightly. Um, what's really, I think one of the things that's really going on is that the underlying Minuteman budget is going up 5%, which is a larger increase than Minuteman has had in the last few years. Um, I've reached out to them to ask some questions about that. We certainly, I know they've reached out to me to uh, talk to the Finance Committee about it. So um, uh, that and uh, the, the last of some of the capital increases mean a very, almost a million dollar increase in Minuteman. Uh, we don't have a final number from Minuteman now, um, so that's still a, a, a question. Health insurance right now is projected to go up 3.95 percent. We'll get the final assessments from the Group Insurance Commission uh, the end of this month, um, and we'll see what that final number is. State aid in this budget is projected to go up 2.94 percent. I can already tell you that that's likely not correct. Mm -hmm. um, the assumption was that our unrestricted general government aid would go up 3% based on some of the preliminary numbers that I had heard at the um, consensus revenue hearing and some of the things I'd heard from some of the people speaking at the uh, consensus revenue hearing. However, the governor has announced that, she's, that the consensus revenue increase is projected at 1.6%. That's a loss for us of just about $120,000 on UGA. So uh, we know that now if the, if the governor follows the previous governor's pattern of giving UGA increases at the same rate as the state revenue goes up. Uh, what we don't know is um, what Chapter 70 school aid is going to be. That is uh, a far bigger number. Um, UGA, uh, we get about $9 million. Um, chapter 70, we get a little over $16 million. So a percent increase in, in Chapter 70 is just a bigger number. Um, the governor said she will announce that before she announces the uh, March 1st budget, uh, and we're still just all waiting to hear that. Uh, similarly, with our, what our assessments are, that's all tied into our budget. Um, and then um, our offsets, Again, those, those will change a little bit um, once we know what our health insurance numbers are. Um, but they are up, they're usually up the same amount that the budget is up because they all kind of rise together. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, we lost uh, a little over $100,000 in that area, so the offset number is up a smaller number. Um, I would pause for just a second to ask if people have questions so far. Otherwise, I'm going to talk about what some of the uh, override scenarios are um, and certainly would be more than happy to answer any specific questions people have. Um, but if there's anything I said that wasn't clear at this point. I, it, so, in, so in order for me to direct the conversation at uh, yes. this point, I'll, I'll need you to stop the screen share because because that's the only way I can get my window into not be so tiny. I could just mention that uh, Mr. Helmuth was the first to raise his hand, and uh, okay. Ms. Mahan raised her hand. Great, thanks. So, Mr. Helmuth? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pillar. Do you, uh, how much confidence do we have uh, in the school budget, particularly the special education costs that are projected for development uh, next fiscal year? Any, any concerns that there being surprises there? No, I don't. Um, I don't see so. I think the school department has been able to manage uh, their special education costs in two ways. Uh, one is that they've moved as many kids as possible to be educated in-house as opposed to outplacement. That saves a lot of money and that's been a trend that they've been uh, using for many years. The second is that they do have a SPED reserve within the school department budget so that if in any one year their costs rise more than uh, they anticipated, uh, they can draw down from that reserve. It's, it's sort of like our reserve fund. So I'm not worried and nor have I heard concerns from them about that as a cost. Thank you. Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two questions, both of which may not really be relevant. <laughs> I'm sort of doing what I did on the treasurer's uh, agenda item. And if that's the case, um, if the town manager and or uh, chair of long range planning committee 
um, want to get me the information after the meeting, that's fine. Um, the first one, which is definitely off the road, but uh, do we know for Minuteman, um, besides that maintenance issue, which we spoke about at a previous meeting, so I won't go into that, but do we know or can we find out when um, Minuteman has its vocational opportunities um, outside of the mandated high school curriculum <coughs> for adults, for different trades. Um, I've, been, I've been following that. I've tried to go on their website to sort of get the uh, graph breakdown of that. Um, but, but they've been very successful, as I would want them to be, um, with that. Um, but to me, that raises the question of A, um, in terms of that, those outside programs, which seem very robust. I've seen a lot where it's filled up. Um, a, is that a figure or numbers we can find out? It, it, if the answer is yes, but it's a really exhaustive, cumbersome ex uh, exercise, then I, I'm not asking for that. But the more important question is B, um, do any of those fundings go back in? Is, is it a separate fund for those monies or does some of it go back to, I'm trying to look at how we can offset Arlington's um, increasing costs to Minuteman, which eventually we do have to pay. I'm not you know, um, disputing that, but um, just where they're really in a very good, unique, healthy, robust situation now with the, with the new vocational school as well as the offerings that they're doing. And it may be under state law that that's just a separate pot of money and if I'm not entitled to know what it is, that's fine. And if it doesn't get to be applied, that's fine too. But, um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, I just, I have a new blood pressure pill. And it's, it's not the, it's, it's the generic. And they said dry throat, so it is. It's nothing else, sorry. Um, the other thing is, and not for tonight, because I don't think it's, um, I've been following what we get in the MMA bulletins. Um, as well as the MMA's partner finance committee. Um, so I know there's big preliminary discussions on the recent ballot question that passed that people know as the millionaire's tax. And I understand that it's, you know, not completely defined, except for it only has two specific purposes under the vote that it can be um, dedicated to. Um, so I don't anticipate I'll, I can get an answer tonight because we just don't know. But whenever we start getting to the point that we hear enough from uh, either Mass Association of Finance Committees, um, MMA, and the Mass Mayor's Association, whatever, in terms of um, what that could be mean to Arlington in the two specific areas that it could be applied to, what that does um, moving forward. And then um, on the health insurance, <clears throat> do you anticipate, um, Mr. Manager, that the 395 is really kind of in the ballpark of, in terms of what we should expect, or is there something that um, you've heard whispers of or maybe see down the road that that could be a number that I doubt will go down? But. Um, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yes, so, yes, yes. yes. Um, on, uh, I will have to look into and get back to you on the Minuteman costs um, and on the millionaire's tax. The estimate that came out at the consensus revenue hearing was that they thought that during uh, 2024 they would bring in approximately $1.6 billion from that. They really haven't started collecting much of it because you only, they, the state collects it only once you have earned a million dollars. So uh, maybe Jason Tatum is starting to pay that now because, but if you're on the Red Sox, I don't know when you get paid. Maybe it's not until the spring. So, um, and, but on that I know they are anticipating collecting the money this year, and I do not think that Arlington will see any of that money until FY25. And then furthermore, um, I have not seen any breakdown as between education and transportation or town or city by city uh, numbers. So uh, we are all eagerly awaiting that. Um, and then on the health insurance, the composite 
rate increase that GIC announced back in uh, end of December, early January was a 6.8% increase. We had raised all of our rates in this budget in earlier than that by 5%. But it really makes a difference which plans people take. So um, I don't know if our people are taking the plans on the higher end or the lower end because we don't know the specific rates for each of the plans yet. We just know the composite number. So I think there is a chance that our health insurance budget will go up more than was in this budget, but um, by how much, I won't know until we see the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank Chair, I'd, I'd continue on with the presentation if that's all right with you. Sure, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also ran a scenario uh, under which we would not need an, an override this spring. Uh, and again, the, these numbers are preliminary. They will become final once we see the state budget. But under this scenario, there are basically three factors this year and next year that would uh, affect whether we need an override this, this spring. One is that if we have new growth of a million dollars for FY24, um, new, that new growth is for things that were already built by this last January 1st or things that are being built between now and June 30th, such as the development at MIRAC. Um, I've been told by the assessor that we already have, he already knows of $750,000 worth of new growth that he can count on. Um, and that doesn't include things that are in the ground being built now. It also does not include uh, information from the state about the personal property or the, uh, the wires and so forth from various utilities. So um, I would say we will know more about that as the year goes along. Um, it is in line with what our new growth has been in the last few years, so I think it's a not unreasonable number. Uh, the second figure is a 7.1% increase in Chapter 70 aid. That would give us about $1.2 million in Chapter 70 aid, which is uh, about the same as we got for the current year, FY23. We do know that our enrollment increase uh, for this year, 108 students, was larger than what we had for the pr when we put together the FY23 budget. That was 96 students. So if we are still getting credit for enrollment increases at the same numbers that we have in the past, if there is Student Opportunity Act funding that's continued along the same pattern that we've had, um, and in the future, uh, I think if that millionaire's tax kicks in, um, I, I think for FY24, a $1.2 million increase in state aid is uh, not, in Chapter 78 is not unreasonable, and then for FY25, a 5% increase, um, which would be, you know, 600, 700,000, somewhere in that range. Um, so um, all of which is to say, I think we are very close to what needing or not needing an override this spring. We don't have the final numbers yet. Um, Long Range Planning Committee is uh, meeting uh, a week from this coming Friday. So we will update them some, and as we get more information from the state, we will share with the Long Range Planning Committee and certainly share with the board. Um, I would just finally point out, next slide please, Ashley. Um, in your packet, you can see a number of different scenarios. The first is assuming that we have a $2.6 million deficit and what size override we would have either in June of 2023 or June of 2024, each override lasting two, three, four, or five years, um, and varying from one as low as $1.4 million, which would just get us through two years of budgets, and then we'd need another one. Uh, that would be a small override, about $102 per average single-family home, versus if we <coughs> waited a year, it's still having a deficit, and we wanted a big five-year override, that'd be a 13, $187 per single family home override, a $19 million override, um, certainly the largest in the state's history. Um, if there's zero deficit, uh, these scenarios to the right, um, we don't would need any override for the next two years, 
and then the numbers sort of fall out in terms of the amount of the override, either this June or next, next June, both in a dollar amount, a percent of the levy, and uh, the tax implication for a single family home. Um, all these numbers will change. <coughs> these are snapshots in time, but I wanted them to give them to you so you have some sense of where things stand. Um, I will just close my remarks by making a few comments about the enterprise fund budgets. Um, the water and sewer budget right now is expected to go up 3.89%. We are using retained earnings, or in other words, the free cash in the water and sewer budget to pay for the debt service for the new DPW building, the, the part of it that water and sewer owes, so that that debt service this year, and I think for the next couple of years, won't hit the rates. Um, uh, Recreation has a um, almost 17% increase. That's really because of the expansion of more and more programs as COVID's ended, they're able to do a lot more things. Uh, RINC is similar in that regard. Um, transportation shows a 34% decrease, not because there's any decrease in the transportation services that we offer for vans to the seniors uh, to go to the community center, but because um, last year for one year, we tried listing a staffer who's always been paid for by CDBG in the budget. We decided that, that just confused things. We took her out again. So it looks like there's a, a dip in uh, that budget, but in fact, the level of services will continue. Um, and AYCC, 11% uh, increase. Again, um, we do see increased uh, service demands. Um, we have been hiring more um, staffers there. They are really paid for by the insurance reimbursements for the children that they treat. So, um, and that is one of those situations. If, if the kids show up and we use the staffers, uh, we have the cost and we get the money. If for some reason they don't, we don't need to bring those staffers in. They're on an on-call basis. So I'm not worried about that, even though it's a big increase. Um, with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks and be happy to answer any further questions people have about the budget. Okay, so now please drop the screen share so I can so everyone can see you all in a large screen, large window. Thank you. Questions? Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Poole, for the presentation and for the summary. And as members and the public can hear, with the unknowns that still exist, that, that hopefully we'll, we'll find out a few more things in the next month, things will become a little bit clearer. Um, but we are at a point that if it's not this June, and unless the state aid figures come through, that maybe we squeeze another year out of it. it it's either this spring or next spring um, for the override. And, and Mr. Pooler had showed us the potential scenarios in terms of if you wait, the ask is much is much greater and it's much in dollars and as a percent of the levy and we've never had a successful override or the, with an ask greater than nine percent of the levy and that was only back in 2006 when an override failed the year before the, the, the last override we had of 5.5 million dollars was 4.7 percent of the levy and that fits into some of the three or well, the three-year scenario of a june 23 override um, as well as in between the three and four years on the um, on, on the fiscal 24. So I think, um, I think in talking at long range planning and talking to Mr. Pooler and to the chair, we thought it was important to get this out on the table um, to, to all of the members and to the public. Um, and you can also see some areas of, of concern here that we may want to look into a little bit more. And, and Mr. Pooler mentioned Minuteman, and, and for me, Minuteman is, we appoint Mr. Bruderman, and it may make sense to bring him in just to give us an update as to what's happening, particularly with the, um, the search for new members to the Minuteman district. It used to be 16 members, and it came down. It is now nine members. Um, and part of the uh, structure of, of Minuteman, we, we have a weighted vote now, so we have more of a say at school committee because we're such a big percentage of the overall enrollment. However, as our enrollment has gone up years ago, what, what we're hoping is our enrollment would go up with a new school, but the other members and new members coming in would grow 
the same or greater than what our growth is, and at least in the short term, that's not happening. But I know this discussion of increasing the capacity of the school, and I think whether it's through a subcommittee or whether it's at a meeting here, it makes sense to, to have him in to talk to us um, and, and perhaps coordinate with the Finance Committee too because they do meet with Minuteman from year to year. I believe Ms. LaCourt is the uh, Minuteman representative on, on their subcommittee. So that, that one to me since 2019 is really striking in terms of the five-year plan back in 2019 called for 3.5% growth in Minuteman's assessment each year and it's been nearly double digits every year and, and it's understandable in a lot of instances because in the short term we're, we're still going to be a large part of it, but it's, it's a major concern going forward in terms of what happens there. Um, and I'm giving more comments than questions, but I, I, I want to thank you again for, for, for the presentation and um, for continuing to provide leadership in terms of uh, providing numbers, scenarios, and ultimately a recommendation at some point in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. And actually, I have a question for you. So, so that is, would you, would you like to have Mr. Rudiman um, a conversation with him before we make the decision about whether to um, do an override? I, I, no, I don't. I don't. I think they, I think it's independent. I mean, because I don't think. Okay. But I think just to get a better understanding as to what some of the goals are and, and, and what's being done, both in terms of new members and allocating capital costs for what few non-member. Uh, communities are still involved up in up at Minuteman. Right, gotcha. No, because that would affect the timing of when we would try to to have him meet with us or with the subcommittee. So that's why I asked. Thank you. Any other um, questions, comments, Alex? Uh, Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just trying to sort of put a time picture on it. Um, does uh, the town manager and or the long range planning committee, do you have, a, we're all about dates, cutoffs, um, in, in decisions. So in, in terms of the override strategy, decision, not strategy, the override decision, um, and this may be something that you're discussing in a week from Friday, but is there a, a date you anticipate say March 1st, March 15th, March 30th, that you would say at this point that this is where the window closes because the state budget numbers do change all the time, but there's a point where, okay, we're, we're pretty close. So um, is there a date or will you be discussing what that date is in terms of when we're gonna say, okay, this is what we know from everything we're gonna get, especially from the state, this is the date that we're going to say, okay, we're going to stop and call it here and, and stop moving forward, as well as um, if there were a spring override vote in June, um, is there a date again? For, to, to me, March seems to be, or is that something you're going to discuss at the next long-range planning meeting that, A, okay, come March 1st, March 15th, March 31st, or some other date, that's going to be it where we stop the clock and that's what we're going to see and that's what we're going to make the decision on knowing that those are the numbers and is the override this spring with the vote in June of this year is the override next spring with the vote in June of 2024 and if that can't be answered tonight that's fine but uh, if, if I may mr. chair yes yes mr. Cooler. so at our last meeting we scheduled two long-range planning committee meetings one in February to continue the, exactly the kind of discussions that you mentioned, and then one in early March, once the governor's budget came out, to make some final decisions. So I think all those questions are subject to conversations among the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, I also think, even though, and this is outside of my realm of responsibility or involvement, um, we have to have some sense of what people out there in the community, what committees are forming or would be ready to form on a timely enough basis to actually run a campaign. Uh, again, um, that is something that members of the Long Range Planning Committee have some awareness of more than I do, but it's an important issue and I know we'll be discussing that uh, in one of those two meetings too. So 
I think those are the timelines. Uh, we'll have final numbers for sure by March 1st on uh, the governor's budget and um, then make, I think, a decision soon thereafter. And I'm not going to hold you to any dates because I know that. But just to get a framework, it's a pretty good bet that probably. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, move receipt questions? of the town manager's um, 2024 budget. Okay. And second. And a second. And a second by Mr. Elvis. Any other questions, comments? All right, so on a motion to receive the common interest budget by Mr. Hahn and a second by Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Okay, um, we're moving on to the consent agenda. And so we have the minutes of meetings January 9th, 2023, January 23rd, 2023, and January 2023, 23, 2023 emergency addendum. We also have the Arlington Public Art Youth Band Initiative on Mass Ave in Arlington Center from April 1st um, to May 31st of this year. Uh, we also have Black History Month banners. Uh, we also have reappointments of Paul Paravano. Disability Commission terms expire on January 31st, 2026. Susan Ryan Palmer of the LGBTQ, LBGTQIA plus Rainbow Commission term to expire on January 31st, 2026. And Lee Newberg, also of the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission term to expire on January 31st, 2026. Number 10, a request. Contractor drain layer license, MC Masonry Construction Corporation, Render the Freites, a Broadway Street Peabody Mass, 01960. So, um, can I get a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay, motion. Okay, so a motion by Ms. Mahan and a second by Mr. Heard. So, I know that um, we have either Sarah Gurney or Stuart, and or Stuart Ikeda here to speak for a minute or two on the Arlington um, Public Use Ban Initiative. Uh, we will likely have them back at a later meeting, you know, to talk a little bit more about these banners. So um, whichever one of you wants to go first. Uh, I'll go first and I will be very brief because I know yeah. you have important work to do tonight. So just I a lot of it, not more important, <laughs> just a lot. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm here on behalf of the Commission for Arts and Culture just to thank and introduce our dedicated coordinator of this youth, year's Youth Banners Initiative, Sarah Gurney, and thank the sponsoring Gracie James Family Foundation, our APS partners, and this year's judges, but also specifically to thank the select board for supporting the use of public banner space like this. Um, what might in some towns be considered mainly an advertising platform, here in Arlington has become a communal space that reflects and spotlights the creativity and the cultural values of our community. Whether, it, whether it's the Youth Artist Banners or the AHRC's Black History Month banners coming up next, um, or other expressive and educational uses. So I just want to thank the Select Board for its ongoing support and hand it over to Sarah. Sarah. Thank you so much for this time. Um, I'm Sarah Gurney. I'm the Arlington Youth Banner Initiative Coordinator. I'm here to propose the installation of the 22 banners in Arlington Center in April and May. This would be 20 banners of youth art and two banners of signage. Um, this is the eighth season of the Youth Banner Initiative that was created in memory of Arlington Public School student Gracie James. Her family has continued to generously fund this project. Um, this year, the theme is Connections. The new Arlington Public School Visual Arts Director has helped lead this project by managing submissions and art judging. We had 150 submissions and seven judges, including Arlington Public School st Art Department staff and two local artists and a select board member, selected 20 winning artworks for banners. We have four middle schoolers and 16 high school students who were chosen. And I can quickly show you um, the banners here. 
that was what we were going to save for later. Oh, okay. Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. No okay. problem. Yeah, nope. absolutely. We'll, okay. we'll do that. And we'll give you give you a lot more time. All right. No problem. Okay. Yes, I just yes, thought yes, I'd yes. introduce. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, with, with an idea that I have. I mean, so great. All right. So. So thanks so. so much. Thank you. Welcome. I mean, it's a great. It's a great event. I mean, uh, great thing that you're doing. Right? You yeah. uh, Any other comments or questions from our colleagues? All righty, so on a motion to approve the consent agenda by Ms. Mahan and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. All righty, so moving on. Sorry about that. Okay, we next have open. So, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented or for consideration <laughs> of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. So I just want to say that we're going to have um, potentially two open forums tonight. You know, if you, and we also have a hearing, you know, for the CDBG request. And so if your comments re relates to uh, anything regarding CDBG, please wait until the hearing. You know, and because we're going to have a second open forum, I want to limit this uh, to 15 minutes. And so. Um, Ms. Meyer, do you have any what, hands up? There are two hands raised at this time. Three. Okay. Three. Sorry. All right. Mr. Chairman, someone in the in the room as well has their hand up. Okay. So, so then, um, let's take um, Lori Leahy, Shannon Arkees, Rebecca Peterson, and then the person in the room, and that'll be it uh, for this first. I'm promoting them to speak now. So, Laurie. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. know I was waiting for no, me. No, no, I hadn't called you. I, no, I, I just called you. That's fine. So, wait for this my until um, it's o'clock. Okay. Um. I'm sorry, my screen just, am, am I to no, speak no, right now? Not, not yet. Okay. The clock. There you go. Okay. okay, so so now you can speak. <laughs> sorry. Okay. No um, Lori Lakey, um, I'm a town meeting member. I am from Precinct 21. And earlier today, I wrote a, an email to all of you. Um, I, I realized I, I think I missed the deadline. So I thought that I would just take a moment to kind of speak to my letter. I won't read the whole thing, but it's about the <clears throat> potential overnight parking ban removal pilot. Um, so is that okay that I talk about that now? You yeah, have two minutes and a half to talk about whatever you want. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Um, so some of my, I, I'm kind of late catching up on the details of this, but I did have a lot of questions. Um, and so I'm going to go through my letter and just read those questions out loud in no particular order. Um, so I think the first question I have is what is what is prompting um, this ban or this pilot? Is it that you have collected a lot of complaints from residents or is it that you are trying to see if it's okay to permanently do away with the ban, ban so that the, to further the, some of the master plan agendas, like specifically for more density and, and less parking. So um, if it's the first one, based on complaints, my questions are, um, how historically has data been collected um, about complaints? And do we know what the complaints are if, if that information is being collected? Do we know that it's people don't like tenant parking, that people are not told by landlords um, that they don't have any parking available to them? Is it that too many cars for their driveway? And where in town are the majority of the complaints or 
or those different types of complaints occurring. Um, uh, let's see, is there a clear, is, is it clear what the select board is, is what questions are trying to be answered by this pilot? I, I haven't seen that written anywhere, like exactly what we're trying to find out. Um, how will the pilot be funded? What are the expected costs of enforcement and additional staff if needed? Um, will this information that is collected from the pilot be made public? And then lastly, the timing of the pilot, I, I saw that it was going to start in the spring and go over the summer, which I would like to urge that you reconsider that, given that during the winter, when we do have snow, after a snow event, there's lots of snow in the street that takes up parking spots and makes it difficult to get out of your driveway and seems like it would be a more realistic time to gather information about how a, a lifting of the ban would it work. Also, um, doing it over the summer, uh, as every summer I've been here, June, July, and August are really kind of ghost towns. It's a kind of a ghost town here, like everyone leaves. So it wouldn't really, I feel like that would really skew the data. Um, also, the mechanism for people to be able to give feedback about the data. I'll be up yeah. tonight. Okay, so we'll be having more time for um, input on this. this is All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, next, Ms. Meyer. Um, Ms. Marquis, if you just want to start whenever you're ready. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Am I up? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, um, good evening. Um, I'm Shauna Marquis, and I live, on, I live with my husband and two kids on Gray Street at Churchill, and I'm also a safety professional by trade. Um, so I'm here to share my concerns about pedestrian safety on Gray Street. So the stretch of gray between Jason and Highland has no stop signs, crosswalks, or speed bumps, um, yet it stretches alongside one of our most popular green spaces, Monotomy Rocks Park. Um, the entrance to the park at the base of Churchill and Valley is also a very convenient entry point for pedestrians. Um, Gray Street is also a very popular bypass for Mass Ave, being a straight shot from the center to the heights, and it can get very busy um, during commuter hours. So this past Thursday morning, my six-year-old son was almost hit by a car as we were negotiating traffic um, crossing Dray Street to get to our bus stop. So every morning I wait until I don't see any approaching cars, and then we run across the street. <laughs> Last week, my daughter jogged across the street and my son lagged behind. I stood in the middle of the road, yelling to get his attention as cars started approaching again. So the cars were coming, I went back to wait with my son. But he darted out thinking it was still safe. We were incredibly lucky that the approaching driver was paying attention. So they swerved and stopped just inches from my son if that driver was one of the many drivers that speed down gray, my son would have most likely been killed. So hills near Churchill and Endicott on Gray Street really limit visibility for cars, cyclists, and pedestrians. We've tried crossing Gray Street at different points, trying the best combination of line of sight and visibility, while also trying to avoid the areas of the road that don't have any sidewalks. We try waiting for cars to stop in both directions, but they rarely stop. We'll stand in the middle of the road, expecting cars to slow down while our kids cross. You'd be shocked <laughs> by the number of cars that continue to speed towards us, forcing us to run. So we started calling the police in 2017 with concerns about speeding. And sometimes a police car will park at the corner of Churchill and Gray. But in the safety world, we call that an administrative control. And it's not nearly as effective as engineering controls like speed bumps. So we, we really need to slow down cars on this road, but we also need to ensure that they're safe and clearly marked crossing locations that are available for pedestrians in this heavily trafficked area. Um, after a recent tragic death, Somerville overhauled Holland Street. They installed protective bike lanes, raised crosswalks, and pedestrian refuge islands. So I ask us to look at our neighboring towns to see what they've done. 
Um, based on the responses that I've received from board members Great. so far, I thank you for your time. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Welcome. So next we have Ms. Peterson. I'm sorry, I think it may have been someone else who was asked to speak. It wasn't me. Okay. Right. Okay. And so, um, so if it wasn't you, then maybe it was Steve Ward. I did see three people. I'm here. I'm Rebecca Peterson. Is it my turn? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so Rebecca Peterson, Florence Ave, and I just had some thoughts I wanted to share about the overnight parking ban and the proposed pilot. Um, I know that two thirds of residents voted to keep the ban in place in 2013. And I really do feel like this ban keeps the streets free of permanently parked cars, but it also contributes to safety, to cleanliness, to more reasonable car insurance rates, and it just maintains our semi-suburban feel. Um, I used to live in a neighboring town that had a parking ban part of the year. As soon as it ended the very first morning at 7 a.m., cars would appear on the streets and not move until the ban took effect again in late fall. This made it really difficult to drive around, very hard for our friends and visitors who might just be coming over for dinner to find a spot anywhere near our house and would often have people blocking our driveway who were you know, parking inconsiderately. The parking ban is one of the reasons we bought a house in Arlington, so we don't have to deal with that. You know, I don't wanna to try to find someone whose bumper is overhanging my driveway at 7 a.m. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned also that the pilot is going forward when it seems like so many residents are opposed to it. And I'm not sure that all of the aspects of the pilot have been thought through. I know that Lori mentioned uh, the seasonal, seasonal aspect of it. You know, what it, we don't have any winter data if we're doing the, the ban in the summer. Is Does this mean that the parking ban will only potentially be lifted in the nice weather and not in the winter? Um, and while I support the overnight parking ban, I do feel like that the current ban is very loosely enforced. And I don't see anything in the pilot that addresses enforcement of the proposed rules. There's a study linked on the agenda website for tonight's meeting, and it quotes um, several studies that the Boston Region MPO Technical Memorandum put out, and multiple studies are saying that, you know, more fewer parking regulations leads to more cars. I think there's about three studies in that document that's linked that says that. So what's gonna happen when people have more cars or leave their cars on the street all the time because they can? Um, and then my last point is that the town has been pushing a lot of measures in the past few years that increase density and reduce green space. And developers have been allowed in a couple of recent projects to put fewer parking spaces in the projects. So if the overnight parking ban is removed, then people's personal property, i.e. their cars, are gonna be stored on town streets. So why would the town on one hand say, we wanna reduce parking minimums in new development to encourage mass transit or biking or walking, but then at the same time, they wanna allow everyone to park on the street and make the location and the storage of these personal vehicles everyone else's problem. So um, my, I just wanted to say that I feel like getting rid of the ban will make Arlington more congested and much less enjoyable to live in. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so I do not have the name of the person in the room, but it is now that person's time to speak. He's there? Okay. Uh, Bob Ridocha, Columbia Road. Um, I recently did a survey online, and I'm not good at doing surveys online, I'll tell you that up front. But um, and one of the other questions had something to do with what are some of your concerns, and it related to traffic and things like that. And I, I tried to make a comment, but I couldn't get the comment through. And as a person that walks my dog often, it can't help but note often you see cars driving excessively fast uh, and 
saying, well, why, what, what's the hurry? Where, where are you going? What are you doing? And I don't know how many years it was, maybe um, six, eight years ago, I came before the selectmen, and the only one that was here, I think, was Diane. The rest of you are all in school doing something else. I don't know. I'm old. You're old. Okay, so you're here. And I was concerned about the traffic and issues, and um, driving through Somerville at the time, I noticed I'm going through over speed bumps everywhere. And I mentioned it here. I said, why aren't we looking into something like that just to s slow it down? And the answer was, well, the fire trucks couldn't get through, the snow plows wouldn't be able to work. They've been working in Somerville and Cambridge. And the bumps, they're not radical bang bumps. They're 15 miles an hour over the thing, but it slows you down. And uh, there are many streets in Arlington that could use a few slow down bumps, slow, easy going. Um, you, you look up at the heights, you got Park Ave, it can be excessive at times. Florence Ave and uh, Bar uh, uh, the other one going down Gray Street, uh, Park Ave Extension on the other side, Forest Street. There's people moving on those streets all the time. And a couple of speed bumps once in a while, bring them down, no big deal. Down at Somerville, I, 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 in fact, they're putting in more on side streets. There's one side street I go down every day. There are four or five of them, and it's no, not any longer than Cleveland Street. And uh, what are they doing? They're doing it down there, and they're controlling it. And I think we ought to be looking at it, particularly in areas around playgrounds and schools, uh, to speed, slow them down before they get to that point. So I'm in favor of it. Uh, speed bumps, uh, I think, can go a long way to curing the problem. And, uh, I don't think, check with some of them, find out how they get over the humps when they're going to a fire. You know, they, they get there and they do manage to plow the streets and they do a pretty good job of that. So just a thought for the future when you get around to that subject sometime. Thank you. And Thank you. The, the reason I came here to do it is I feel bad for you sitting in an empty room <laughs> and you're looking out at, well, you do have some people tonight, but often there's nobody there and there's nothing like being on stage with no audience. So, <laughs> I actually appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And so, so that now ends the first open forum. We are moving on to item number 11, uh, CDBG performance update for program year 2022-2023. And that will be uh, with Mary Mazinski, Community Development Block Grant Administrator. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Mary Mazinski, the Community Development Block Grant Administrator with the Department of Planning and Community Development. Uh, tonight I have two agenda items to review with the board. Um, first is the CDBG mid-year report and summary of applications for the up and then summary of applications for the upcoming program year. And afterwards, um, during the public hearing, the sub-recipient representatives will present an overview of their program year 49 applications, a brief overview. Um, just to get started, this is the town's 48th consecutive year receiving HUD funding. We are currently in year three of our five-year consolidated plan period. Um, there are a wide range of uses uh, that benefit Arlington residents, especially households with low, low and moderate incomes. Over a million dollars has been allocated to affordable housing, public parks and infrastructure, public services, and economic development activities this year. Some of the highlights from the mid-year report by category include, for affordable housing projects, the Housing Corporation of Arlington is using grant funds carried over from previous years to continue capital improvement projects to their affordable housing portfolio. Arlington Housing Authority began their large capital improvement projects at the Hauser Building at Drake Village, and at mid-year, their fire alarm upgrade project is on schedule. Caritas Communities project has have been delayed due to staff turnover and supply chain issues. Capital improvements are forthcoming with contractor procurement underway as of December 2022. And public service activities, uh, most of our subrecipients provide uh, public services to the community. All are on track to accomp accomplish their goals by the end, by the program year's end. Notably, Fidelity House's Monotomy Manor Outreach Program has exceeded their goal for the year, and the Boys and Girls Club Scholarship Program has met their goal for the number of households served. 
443 residents have benefited from programming so far this year, which is 38% of the goal reached by mid-year. Uh, these numbers are a little lower mid-year than, than usual. Uh, Council on Aging's adult day health accomplishments will be reported with Q3. And the Boys and Girls Club Swim Safety Program is scheduled to start in April. So those accomplishments will be reported with Q4. Uh, for public facilities and improvements, uh, some public facilities projects have faced delayed timelines due to recent upheaval in the construction industry, which has impacted costs and necessitated additional planning. Nonetheless, all are moving forward. DPW reported constructing 48 ADA compliant curb ramps. Whittemore Park ADA accessibility improvements have been completed. The final plantings and landscaping should be completed this spring. Food Link's generator project has been expanded to include other small related small scale projects to complete the fit out of the facility and their solar panel project is underway. And the Recreation Department has completed the Parmenter Playground renovation. For planning and administration, uh, our, which is our final category, <laughs> um, DPCD has participated in a number of CDBG funded projects. Recently, planning studies began to, up, to update the model of the Millbrook corridor that informs decision making about flooding and infrastructure improvements. And Ar Envision Arlington's annual town survey has been released and will be available for residents to take until March 1st. That concludes a portion of my mid-year report. Um, if there are no questions about current CDBG activities, I'll move on to the second CDBG agenda item, which is program year 49 funding requests. Let me check with my colleagues and see if there are any questions about mid-year. Seeing none, and yes, we can move on. Thank you. Thank you. So in recent years, Arlington has received an entitlement grant of just over $1 million. And we plan to receive a grant of this size again for Program 49. We estimate that the program income for the upcoming year will not be more than $20,000. Program income funds have been trending downward as the number of remaining Arlington home rehab loans decrease. Grant awards will be budgeted accordingly. We received 21 applications that were submitted this year, including new and returning applicants and projects. The full application portfolio was included with the meeting materials. Um, we received requests for six new projects this year, including uh, for public services, Arlington Center for the Arts Scholarship Program, Arlington Center for the Arts Program at Housing Authority locations, and uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington's application for a civic engagement coordinator position. Um, and then under public facilities and improvements, Robins, Robins Library Accessible Restroom Renovation, Arlington Veterans Memorial Park, and the Zero Waste Committee's application for Arlington on Tap water bottle filling stations. The Department of Planning and Community Development request for funding includes CDBG program administration, a portion of the planner's salaries while working on CDBG related activities, as well as objectives for program year 49, which include long-range planning for housing and related studies to help in the creation and preservation of affordable housing and, minimi and minimize displacement, um, and to conduct analyses to provide recommendations for the following plans, Connect Arlington, Net Zero Action Plan, the Affordable Housing Action Plan, the Housing Production Plan, and to begin development of the Master Plan Update process. So the next steps the application process include um, CDBG subcommittee meetings to review the applications and draft a budget recommendation for the board's approval. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and then I'd like to request that we turn the public hearing to allow CDBG applicants to share a brief overview of their proposals. Thank you. So I'll turn to my colleagues, any questions at this point? Ms. Mahan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when, after tonight, and we do the next step of the CDBG subcommittee meeting, um, will we use the same framework in matrices as we have in the past, meaning that besides every subcommittee member receiving the application, um, there was like a three or four page 
-hmm. scoring yes, for exactly. each project, as well as um, we didn't get it with the half year report. Um, so going forward, if we could get traditionally in the past when we've gotten the half year report, we also see the dollar amounts mm -hmm. amount allocated, you know, 120,000 amounts spent to date half year. Da -da. And we have the same thing at, at CDBG, usually three to four years um, previous, so that we can look at, and we did make a decision, I believe it was last year, um, it might have been the weatherization program, or perhaps a year before, where they had consistently been asking for six figures, um, and we had those numbers that we could see three years ago, they asked for 250 and were granted, two years ago they asked for 200,000 and were granted, this year they're asking for 150,000, and that helped us make the decision to say, we're, we're gonna stop funding that, and uh, the planning department looked into and saw that uh, they didn't have the necessary uh, sort of ducks in a row to accept the money. So that what it did was when the CDBG subcommittees really making, some people might say, hey, it's only a million dollars and you know, the town budget, depending on who you talk to, is 90 to 120, 130 million. But it's like a really important million dollars, especially when you're looking at some of the programs, as you know, that are 10,000, 15,000. Um, so very long question to say, um, when the CDBG subcommittee meets, um, will we, and I'm open to doing something different that um, makes the best use of every, everybody's time, so I'm not saying we can't change anything, but um, are we going to have, if not sort of the same information as we have before? We're gonna have the same information in the same format or the same information in a different format? I plan to have it in the same format, um, but I wasn't sure about that, five, was it the five-year history that you were looking for? So I'll be more than happy to, you know, absolutely, that's very important information. Yeah, you if you could check with, um, was it Ms. Sul Mallory Sullivan? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you could just say, w what she would do was, um, we wouldn't get it before the CDBG sub, you know, the packet that we got just had the applications and had sort of that scoring card mm -hmm. for each um, application. But then when we had the actual meeting, she would pull up um, through whatever technology, um, a spreadsheet so that the subcommittee could look at, because traditionally, I'm going to say 75 to 85 percent, their projects we're familiar with. So we can look at that historical data. Every now and then there's something new, and then that's a separate discussion. So what she would do is say, okay, you know, um, she'd pull up each one when we got to Boys and Girls Club, we got to DPW curb cuts, She'd pull it up, and we could see that what the trend was for. For some reason, I want to say it went back as far as five years, but maybe not. Sure. But it was definitely at least three. So if you could just check with that. And that really was helpful in terms of managing our time. And when we were making those nail-biting decisions um, to, to do that. And, and traditionally, there's been at least two meetings, because um, invariably, after the first meeting, even though we technically have everything before us, and, and Mr. Hurd is also on the committee, and I apologize for monopolizing, played Monopoly with my grandsons this weekend, monopolizing the time, but um, invariably after that first meeting when we're making those decisions that, you know, oh, this is really difficult, we have anywhere from two, no more than four or five questions to the planning department saying, can you go back to the weatherization program? We noticed this trend. Um, they haven't spent it the previous two years for 350,000, now they're, you know, can you go back to, uh, I should make up a name, um, the gray paint swimming program and do they really need the 50 or, or and, some, and stuff like that. So invariably the, there's at least two meetings um, and I'm not trying to make extra meetings. Anyone who knows me, I always say I'm allergic to subcommittees. So, um, <laughs> I, I'm not, but, but I also respect the process in having the meeting. So long way around that. Um, thank you and welcome. I don't mean to do all this to you. Nope. Um, but uh, and also, you know, I have said to, um, a few, I think at least one of the new subcommittee members, but perhaps not all, um, 
just because of opera funding and the CARES Act, we did meet um, more than traditionally the one CDBG. So I don't anticipate that there'll be a CARES Act or um, additional opera, but there may be on the opera. So um, one of the things that I think is really beneficial is whenever you get, if it happens, that, oh, it looks like there's going to be something coming from the federal government, um, the soonest, um, and I'm not saying my colleagues on the subcommittee meeting don't follow the U.S. Treasury Department and the federal government and all the different extra fundings that come out, but um, if, as soon as you see that coming up, uh, if you could just do an email blast to everybody, even if it's to say it's a possibility, it may not happen, but if it does, you know, please be prepared in June, August, October. So, because we had at least two extra meetings, um, the CARES Act and some opera funding. So, that's it. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. And, and Mr. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I just briefly want to thank you, Ms. Musinski, for the presentation, but also welcome you, congratulate you on your appointment you. as the CDBG Administrator. I know you just started at the beginning of January, and uh, thank you for your efforts to date. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Anyone else? All right. You know, so, uh, and so uh, just following on a little bit with, uh, with, uh, with my colleague, Ms. Mahai, said about the process. So um, she's made it clear to me that in the past there have been uh, 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 a, a longer hearing, you know. Um, and so so um, I think that might be a good idea to do this year as well. So I just want people who are in uh, the meeting and, and who want to speak and to keep in mind that we may very well have another hearing uh, where um, more people can say more. And so so um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Ms. Musinski. I just want to thank the board very much. Thank you. You don't want to say, oh, Mrs. Mahan, you don't look that old. Oh, Mrs. <laughs> Mahan, you're not old. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. And then um, can we now open the public hearing for um, comments, brief comments? I'm just yes. I'm going to enable people to raise hands. I'm not sure who's here to speak other than the people that are sitting in front of me. So. So, there's a number of people in the room that are here to speak, but there's also, I'm sure, people on the Zoom land <laughs> that would like to speak. So. And Mr. So. Chairman, could perhaps we maybe start with the people who are in the room, yeah. um, yes. and then um, once you clear that, go to the people joining us hybrid by Zoom. Yes, and so I was in the impression that the, some of the present there, there were going to be some um, people present in on giving projects. Or, or topics? Yes. Okay. So they can come up in whatever order they want. Hello all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. I'm Anna Litton, um, Director of Libraries here in Arlington, and I'm very grateful to be able to share information tonight with you on the Robbins Library Accessible <laughs> Restroom Renovation Grant Application. Robbins Library is a community gathering spot for all in our community. Each week, we are open 63 hours to the public and welcome almost 20,000 visitors to our library every month. Our visitors range in age from toddlers and strollers to older adults using mobility devices. Our goal is to serve every <coughs> single member of the community who steps through our doors with dignity, compassion, and the best library services possible. Robbins Library's original building dates back to 1892. In 1994, as part of the library's major addition project, two public restrooms were added to the first floor. These restrooms are still the only public restrooms for the first, second, and third floors of the libraries. Our restrooms do not meet current American with Disability Act requirements. Toilets are not appropriately spaced from walls. Churning radius space is not adequate to accommodate a wheelchair. The town's 2019 ADA transition plan calls out the Robbins Library restroom specifically as an area for improvement. On page three of the transition plan includes the following. 
The Robbins Library is another example of a facility that provides access to most programs, yet the facility lacks an assistive listening system in the community room and fully accessible toilet rooms, which many individuals with mobility uh, disabilities require. In 2019, the library added assistive hearing technologies in the community room funded by library state aid. This grant request seeks to address a stated need and bring the library restrooms into ADA compliance. This grant request for $152,000 under the public facilities and improvements category gives better access to town <coughs> facilities to anyone who might need an access accessible restroom due to disability, accident, injury, or age. We hope the CDB Grant Committee supports town and library goals by funding this grant request and creating accessible spaces for all who visit our beautiful and vital library. I look forward to answering questions from the subcommittee at a later date. Thank you. Hey, stranger. Hello, my name is Lisa Urban. I'm, I work at Fidelity House. I'm the youth program director. Um, first of all, I want to thank you guys for your support for the kids of our community over the years and also thank you for being able to meet in person. I am not a remote person up there and uh, I'm so happy to just be able to meet up with you guys. Um, and of course, I'm asking for two programs that we run every year, but um, they're so necessary, so I think it's important that I come here and you put a name with the program and um, if you ever get to Fidelity House and see it, you'd, you'd see the kids' names with the uh, program. But we are asking for a Manami Manor um, outreach program, which includes summer camp, which is a huge component of it, um, and then a school year program where right now we're just doing an on-site program on site there and then also um, scholarships so that the kids can use our programs, um, memberships, you know, when they come to Fidelity House. Um, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible so that kids can use that program, whatever works best for them. And uh, to be honest with you, transportation is a key one for that program. Um, but we use the CDBG money mainly for the summer scholarships. Uh, it probably funds 21% of our, the program that we run. And then our um, other program is for youth that we hire that work with the kids and uh, have had a huge impact on the kids that work at Fidelity House. It, the program is beneficial to the kids. It's definitely beneficial to Fidelity House, but it's also beneficial to the kids that come to Fidelity House. Um, so I'm hoping you support us again this year. And... Welcome back to regular meetings, mm -hmm. and thank you. A any questions? I know you like to keep it short and sweet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Excuse me. I'm going to do that all night. Sorry. <clears throat> When I've promoted all of the people into. Okay. Okay. So I thought maybe there was another person in the room to speak. No? Uh, no we're all set. All the people so we're all set with people in the room? Okay. Great. And so, so then uh, maybe you have the order um, which you put them in, you know? So, so um, let's um, bring, up, bring them up and, and speak. Okay. So do you have an order? Yeah, um, if Miss Kimberly Sarah, <clears throat> I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name wrong. If no problem. You can go if you're ready. Yep, absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kimberly Sarah. Um, I am here to speak about Operation Success. Um, previously, Janet McGuire was running it, and she's phasing into retirement. Um, so I'm the new face. Um, 
it's been running for 24 years and we're just hoping that we can get the funds to continue to run it. So for those of you that don't know, it's an academic assistance um, program that we offer to middle and high school students that live in Menominee Manor. So it is open Monday through Thursday night from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Um, and is staffed with all volunteer teachers and community members. Um, and primarily we're asking for money for school supplies to give to the students, both at the beginning of the year to make sure that they're set up for success and then to replenish them as the year goes on and anything that we need to help them with their homework while they're working with us each night. Um, Previously, before COVID, we'd have somewhere between, I think it was like 15 and 25 students each night, and we shut down during the COVID year. Um, so our numbers are a little bit lower than they previously were, but we are slowly growing our program every year. Uh, we reopened last year and had about, I think, five students showing up um, consistently. Now we have about nine showing up consistently um, and really just trying not only to make it so that they have no like supply issues with finding success in their academics, um, but we're also instilling good study habits with them and we're just creating really good community bonds. I'm actually a teacher at the Audison and I see these kids uh, from time to time in the hallway and it's just a good way to make connections. Um, so we are asking for $5,000 for school supplies to service what we are hoping to be 15 to 20 students next year as we slowly continue to grow. Um, and we came up with that number that's what we usually have been asking for pre-COVID, but just to think about it in the way that all um, the inflation has gone up for everything. And if you have kids, think about all of the money that you spend on school supplies when you bring them at the beginning of the year to get stuff, but then also to replenish throughout the year. Um, so it breaks down sort of that way for us. Um, and we're hoping just to continue to grow the project and keep it going. Um, I know Janet wanted to say hi and thank you to everyone that has been supporting this program for years. Um, and yeah, thank you. And also, hi, Len. Um, thanks for talking to the eighth graders a couple of weeks ago. I know they found it really helpful. Oh, that was wonderful. That was really wonderful. And it was all remote and it was all wonderful. <laughs> so, so I know that yeah, I know a lot of people who want to be in person are all about that. But us remote people, we have a good time too. We connect we very strongly. So great, you know, thank you, you know. Thank you, everybody. What's next? Hi. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me. I um, put in two requests, so I'll try to be brief and not overstay my welcome. Um, the and and one was for housing related capital projects. The other was a social services request. Um, so to start with the. Um, capital request for our housing, uh, we've requested funding again, um, as we have in past years, to support capital repairs at our buildings. Um, we do have capital reserve funds, but um, the cost of construction, the cost of materials has not kept up with how those capital reserves have grown. And in particular, we have 70 of our units are in our scattered site portfolio. So they're in smaller buildings of two to nine units that we've acquired over many different years. Um, on different schedules, you know, these are like Victorian two families and the cost to maintain those is just challenging. There's, there's no uniformity in that right now. Um, so the money from the town has been really essential in helping us sort of maintain the integrity of our buildings and maintain these buildings um, and um, to supplement our capital reserves. So we're requesting $200,000 again this year. Um, actually, I think we did not request anything last year. I think in our executive director transition and some transitions, we didn't do that last year. Um, and it'll support us in doing things like new roofs, new windows, upgrading bathrooms, new railings, that kind of thing. Next year, we do plan to do a capital needs assessment. And one of the things I'm hoping to do is, is think about how can we get some of our, our disparate buildings on a schedule or see economies of scale so in the future, maybe things can be a little more uniform. Um, but in the meanwhile, and perhaps even still then, this kind of money is really essential to maintain these older buildings. Um, so that, that's that request. And then I'll, I'll just move right over to the other request, which is um, funds for a new position, a civic engagement coordinator, um, completely different from the other. Um, and again, this would be a new position. And um, 
the goal would be to help really build awareness and understanding about affordable housing among people in Arlington, but also to build voice and leadership among low-income families here so that they can participate more in a few ways. One way would be through tenant councils in our own affordable housing so that we can have the tenants who live in HCA housing take a more active role with us on property management issues um, and in working with us on, you know, what are the policies, the management issues, even programs that they'd like to see. But in addition, it would be about engaging our own tenants, other low-income families in Arlington, and even educating anybody, regardless of income, um, helping people become more aware um, and more educated and, and informed about how to participate in local processes, particularly around housing issues. Um, so for example, in the past year, I remember thinking when the housing trust was doing its action plan, oh, if we had this person, we could have engaged more people in that housing trust action plan process. Or now that MBTA communities, the town is doing a public process there. Wow, if we had the staff person, we could be engaging more people and educating them about how the town makes decisions. Um, so, you know, this is a new program. And the reason why I'm going to the town is because it can be hard to get money for new programs from external foundations. I'm hoping once we can show some outcomes that in the future, then we'd be able to go to some of these more other traditional sources and not have to come to the town. Um, but the goal would be a real investment in local low income families so that they might feel more confident, more capable, more understanding of how to participate in public forums um, where housing or, or other issues related to low income families come up and that we could have more voice from these populations, which I think would result in better conversation, richer conversation, better outcomes and decision making in the town. So that's the goal for that. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Any questions, comments from my colleagues? Okay, we'll move on. Thanks, Erica. The next person will be Jack Nagel. <coughs> Hello. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the select board in the, in the CDPG subcommittee on behalf of the residents and the board of the Allenton Housing Authority for the many years of generous giving to our various programs, whether it's for capital, or as you've seen from some of the others, uh, for the other programs that benefit our residents either directly or through different scholarships and things like that. So um, I'd also like to, to thank the others on this call who are, you know, volunteering or running these really important programs that um, really make a difference for our residents. But moving on to the project that we that we're applying for funding this year, we're requesting three hundred two thousand five hundred dollars. And the reason for that number is that's the assessed cost for this project by the DHCD system at this time. Um, this project is extremely important. It's going to update the exhaust, exhaust fan and air handlers at the Hauser building, which is our largest single um, affordable housing development in our portfolio. And, and as we've seen over the last few years, you know, these types of systems are extremely are an extremely important uh, piece of the infrastructure in our buildings related to health and safety. Um, you know, this is something that we identified during the pandemic or more recently over the past year and have really um, sought to, to address it as quickly as possible. The, the original, this is the original system to the building um, installed in 1975. It had an original shelf life of 20 years and DHCD extended that shelf life for another 23 years, which expired in 2018. So um, as you can see, it's, a, it's an extremely important update and, um, and we look forward to your continued support and if there are any questions from the subcommittee or otherwise, um, you know, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. The next person will be Kevin Flood. Hello, Kevin. All right, I think I'm unmuted here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Again, I, you know, I think I'd like to you know, thank the select board again for your support throughout the years of, uh, of the Boys and Girls Club and all the, all the programs and activities that we've uh, run over the years there. And uh, this evening, um, you know, I'm requesting some funding for uh, financial assistance for families during the summer months for our scholarship program. And that's to help parents and caregivers who work and need uh, you know, full daycare for their kids. Uh, we're looking, you know, during the summer, we run a bunch of programs. We run a, a kid's own program for ages five to nine, full day, uh, Creative Explorer for three to five, a boating exploration program 
uh, with kayak and sailboating, paddleboarding, some STEM programs, um, and a program for 10 to 12 year olds, our extreme summer where kids go on field trips and experience, uh, you know, unique spots uh, throughout the state. So um, we are requesting 20,000 uh, for that scholarship program to help all these uh, families and kids that uh, need that extra support this summer. The other program that we're um, looking for uh, support and, and requesting funding for is our swim safety program. Uh, we're running an American Red Cross program, Learn to Swim, um, safety skills and stroke introduction. The safety skills that we're gonna run are gonna include entering, exiting the water without, uh, you know, without uh, stairs or ladders, uh, submerging underwater and, breathe, and uh, breath control, back floats, front floats, survival floats, uh, treading water and deep water orientation. And, uh, you know, each activity will combinate with uh, some water games at the end of each lesson. So, again, we all know the importance of knowing how to swim. And um, we anticipate that, you know, this year's program that we're about to run uh, in April will be a huge success and uh, fully anticipate um, if we're fortunate to get funding for next year to uh, repeat it again. So, um, Thank you very much for your support and your consideration. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? All righty. We're all set. Thanks again. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, Mr. Chair and the Select Board. It's great to be here again to talk about um, CDBG. This sneaks up every year, um, but I really value the time that we have to present these programs. Um, at the Council on Aging, um, we have applied again for our three um, grants that are extremely important to us, um, very, a very big part of our budget and the services we provide. Um, I first also wanted to really thank everybody for the role that all of you and, and our town as a whole played in the renovation um, for the community center that reopened since April. Um, since that date, we've had over 2,000 um, residents over age 60 come in and sign up um, to be a part of our center and have really started engaging in our programs and are meeting with social workers, accessing the um, services of our nurse and really all of the social interaction that the center was built to, to provide. So I'm really proud of that and I wanted to thank everybody. Um, in, in that, we have you know our three grants really are necessary in providing services to all of these folks that are accessing the center. Um, the three grant applications are for our transportation program, um, for our volunteer and transportation coordinator, which is a part-time staff position at the Council on Aging, and also our adult day health scholarship program. So I'll just give a brief, um, a brief overview of those programs. Um, our transportation program um, this year is projected to complete over 8,000 rides for adults over age 60, um, and that encompasses um, quite a big chunk is through our senior um, accessible vans that you probably see around town. Um, since the reopening of the center, we've had a huge surge in the need for those vans. Um, we hear quite frequently that the parking around the Maple Street location is not ideal, and we um, offer the van ride for free now for rides to the senior center so people can get to us without having to worry about um, parking and we're hoping to be able to continue doing that. Um, we also continue to provide people with rides all over town to medical appointments and grocery shopping um, on the vans and then outside of town through volunteers um, and also through partnerships with Uber and our taxi program. Um, our volunteer and transportation coordinator position that I mentioned is the, is the other um, application that we have applied for through CDBG um, is, the per, is the person that really coordinates all of the ride requests and scheduling and also all of the volunteers that the COA manages. Some of those, like I mentioned, are volunteers that provide transportation, but others, and we have about 300 volunteers this year, um, are doing all sorts of things like being greeters when you come into the center. Um, they are monitoring programs. They're assisting with our hybrid programs. They are delivering, um, you know, turkey dinners on Thanksgiving morning. And thanks to all of you who have participated in that. Um, and really managing managing all of those volunteers that make it happen. Our, our small staff, mostly part-time, could not do it without our volunteers. 
Um, and finally, our Adult Day Health Scholarship Program is really vital to people in town that need an additional level of care that our center does not provide. Um, Cooperative Elder Services is in town on Broadway. Um, it's a wonderful Adult Day Health Program that um, is available to people. Um, it is an expensive program. It is a, um, it's something that a lot of people need and caregivers need so that they can get respite from um, caregiving for their family member, their friend, their, their spouse, their partner. Um, and again, it provides another level of monitored care um, that we um, don't provide at the community center. So these scholarships help um, give, give residents the opportunity to try the Adult Day Health Program um, for about a month. Basically, that's about the funding that they get from the scholarship to try out um, the Adult Day Health Program and see if it would be a good fit for them. And there is um, a, about 12 residents so far this year that have been able to participate in the program thanks to these scholarships and we're hoping to double that the second half of this year. Um, so those are our three applications and I'll always be available for questions um, if there ever are any. But thank you again for the opportunity. And thank you, and then, uh, I, I, I know this is that, I know with the, the transportation element, you know, the, there are some concerns about how fragmented it is I mean, across I mean, municipalities and how you know, people who need that transportation have a hard time getting from point A to point B. I know this doesn't really apply to what you're asking for. I guess what I'm thinking is that I, I know that there's going to be another initiative to try and coordinate you know, all these services again. I mean, every four years, I mean, the Washington PO Metropolitan Planning Organization does this coordinated um, human transportation plan. And there is a big push to try to you know, fill the gaps and then connect everything. I mean, and one big person behind that you may know is Susan Barrett um, from Lexington. And so, um, you know, we, we tried before, but we just have to keep trying. I mean, and so maybe sometime, maybe think about that I mean, for next year's I mean, application. I mean, uh, so, so thank you for all the work that you do I mean, for um, um, the Council Aging. So, yes, thank you. So with that, the next person. Larry Slotnick. Um, <clears throat> hello. Hello, Larry. Um, hi. Uh, good to see you all. I'm here uh, on behalf of two organizations that are within uh, both last year's and the, the coming year's uh, CDBG activities. The first, uh, I'd like to talk about Food Link briefly, uh, if I can. So we successfully completed. Uh, in July of last year, the installation of a 17 kilowatt backup generator. Uh, in the event of a local power outage in the area, um, we will at minimum be able to keep our refrigeration system, our loading dock, uh, doors, our lighting, internet, and a few other important uh, electrical circuits operating uh, because Foodlink itself operates uh, about 300 and I'll say 50 days a year. Um, regarding this coming uh, year and, and something that uh, Mary mentioned uh, is a 24 and a half kilowatt uh, rooftop solar uh, array. And the expected completion on that uh, is May 15th of this year. This year. Uh, that will offset all of our power usage for our 280 square feet of walk-in refrigeration and freezer storage space. Uh, it'll offset a little more than the power that we use for that. Um, and just as a reminder, Foodlink uh, collects and distributes uh, more than 1.2 million pounds of food each year. And that, those distributions go to about 100 agencies, including about uh, 10 to 15 locations, uh, entities right here in the town town of Arlington, maybe even closer to 20. Uh, second reason I'm speaking to you is on behalf of the Zero Waste Committee, uh, where I'm co-chair and have been involved uh, in that committee for about seven years. Uh, so we should recall that at town meeting last year, uh, the meeting approved a new bylaw 
uh, that we were proponents uh, for to ban the sale of bottled water in Arlington, and it went into effect uh, just this past November 1st. And this affected, um, impacted convenience stores and, and a bunch of takeout restaurants. Uh, it also affected uh, some iconic venues, uh, such as the Capitol Theater and the Regent Theater. I'll report that, um, so this was uh, water in plastic, single-use bottles. Uh, a number, if not the, you know, the majority have uh, begun the sale of bottled water in aluminum bottles. Uh, we knew this would be a result of, of that ban. Uh, aluminum is much more highly recyclable material than the plastic, and consumers uh, just have a much greater tendency of saying to themselves, yes, I am going to make sure I get this bottle into a recycling bin. Uh, whereas plastic bottles, uh, more often than not, uh, tend to end up as trash and, uh, and litter also, uh, degrading a number of things. So, uh, as we were uh, contemplating that, that article for town meeting, we knew that we uh, should be thinking about, uh, I guess you could say, mitigation um, of this impact uh, it's not necessarily for the businesses, but for the community. Uh, and this was about making drinking water available in more public locations uh, around town. And so, you know, we've had lengthy discussions, uh, interactions with Mike Rademacher, uh, with Joe Connolly at the rec department, and also with um, Jim Feeney in facilities. Uh, and uh, we launched an initiative that's known as Arlington on Tap uh, last fall, probably in September. We started trying to gather, uh, you know, some political momentum in town, you know, with the three folks I just mentioned uh, and others. And we also were able to work with uh, Sean Garbley at the state level, and he was able to secure a $50,000 grant uh, earmarked for Arlington specifically uh, to fund the installation of outdoor bottle filling stations. So together we've identified four, the first four of what we think will be a network of hopefully around a dozen uh, bottle filling locate, you know, stations or locations around town. The first one is uh, you know, almost complete, uh, only not complete because of the season that we're in, but in conjunction with the herd field renovation undertaken by uh, Parks and Rec and possibly funded by some CDBG money, I think um, a new bottle filling station will be, uh, have its installation completed in the spring uh, when the new field is open, all the infrastructure, all the underground uh, work uh, was done in the in the fall and uh, very early winter. So that will be the first, uh, and that will be mostly paid for out of that $50,000 grant. The second and third locations are uh, at right near uh, in Uncle Sam's Plaza, possibly connected to the small structure that uh, is at Uncle Sam's Plaza, and the third will be down in uh, at Thorndike Field, kind of in the part of the field that's close to the, the, dog, uh, the dog park down there. The fourth location is what we, uh, of what we've proposed to CDBG to help with funding uh, on. And this will be, uh, a, as the three that I just mentioned are along the Minuteman Bikeway, uh, where they're not only cyclists, but just walkers, um, uh, folks pushing baby strollers and, uh, you know, just uh, enjoying uh, themselves and the, the nature, part of the nature that the town can offer. This will be at the intersection of Mill Street and the Minuteman Bikeway. So that's the a fairly busy uh, Minuteman Bikeway intersection uh, that's kind of right near where Shattuck Hardware is. 
we're pinpointing the exact location. Uh, I'm actually talking to folks at Intercontinental Real Estate. They're the developers and owners of the Brigham Square Apartments, and they own property. Well, that, that complex uh, abuts the bikeway, but they also own property that's uh, closer to where Shattuck Hardware is. In fact, they own that building that is currently uh, vacant that's directly across the parking lot from the Shattuck Hardware building. Uh, so this might be sited on their property. Uh, I'd like it to be sited on Town of Arlington property, but uh, we're still kind of working through uh, the details of what the possibilities are. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a summary of what our request is uh, from the committee to uh, CDBG about the sixteen thousand uh, dollars toward uh, the cost of of that uh, bottle filling station. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just <laughs> made a little bit. Yeah. Any questions, comments? All right. Oh, Mr. Hurd. And maybe I'm losing my mind, but did he just say that there was a request for food link? I just don't see it on the... Okay, I thought he said his report he they were asking that, yeah. for a new one. <laughs> no. Thank, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss something on our list here. Thanks. No. I was looking too. <laughs> Sorry if that was confusing. All right. all right, so I think we're all set. I did say I might be losing my mind, so I guess... No, I'll... you are. You digress. <laughs> The next so person I'll be promoting is um, Tom Formicola. Last but not least. Definitely not. My name is Tom Formicola. I'm here from the Arlington Center for the Arts, and I want to say thanks to the Select Board and the CDBG Subcommittee and the Department of Planning for this opportunity. Arlington Center for the Arts is proposing a new partnership with the Arlington Housing Authority offering monthly art programs to low-income residents at all five AHA sites from October 2023 through May 2024. The grant request is for $15,000. It's primarily for instructor fees and materials. Uh, over eight months, we'll conduct 40 sessions that will engage 10 to 20 students each. Um, in total, we anticipate serving 600 unique and returning participants. ACA has had a series of planning meetings with the AHA staff, and we've also begun conversations with the tenants associations at the sites. Uh, introductory art making classes will be intentionally designed with low barriers for participation to maximize engagement in a welcoming and respectful environment. The goal is for participants to discover their own creativity and to appreciate the expression of others fostering uh, new connections between neighbors and inspiring community pride. Uh, we hope these experiences will encourage participants to further explore the arts and become more actively engaged with the local cultural community. With the successful completion of this program, we hope to institutionalize these on-site opportunities to facilitate more engagement and free and low-cost low activities off-site and to promote scholarship opportunities at ACA for students who want to take a deeper dive. ACA has submitted a second request for $5,000, in fact, for scholarship funds, which will serve adults, children, and teens through our year-round classes and camps. Last year, we provided 13 full and partial scholarships to students from low-income households. We hope to double that number this year. So thanks to you all for your consideration of these proposals, which are developed to advance diversity and equity and inclusion in a healthy and a vibrant community. Thank you. Any questions, comments, colleagues? Well, I have one. Certainly not least in, uh, in your application, you cited a recent study conducted by Animating Democracy in a program for Americans for the Arts. I checked out the site. It's an amazing site. It's really a great site. I mean, it's all about creating civic engagement through arts and culture. Um, it seems like it has some, some really good articles there. So, so just seeing that was a, really a, a, big, a big plus uh, for me in terms of just learning more and, 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 and seeing some other possibilities. So I think it's really a great program and, uh, for, uh, for, 
for for everyone, but especially I mean, for the uh, the residents of our um, housing authority community. So thank you very much for bringing this forth. I hope you you get the funding. So so um, so with that, I think we are done with the presentations by the applicants. I mean, and so I will um, turn to the um, residents. I mean, um, or uh, participants in the meeting to see uh, if um, they want to make any comments. And with the understanding, me, that uh, we will very likely have me, a bigger hearing at some point after the CDVG um, committee, subcommittee has done its work, I'm going to maybe limit it to 15 minutes so that uh, we can move along with the rest of the, um, our agenda. So um, any hands? I see no hands at this time. All right. All right. Well, great. You know, so then uh, we'll move on uh, to the next item. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I move receipt of the uh, 2024 request for CDBG funding? Sure. Second. So, uh, all right. So any questions, comments? All right. Now for me, it's on a motion to receive uh, the video report by um, uh, Mrs. Mahan and a second by Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Hearn? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's yes. unanimous vote. Great. <clears throat> All right. Um, moving on. So we are into the traffic rules of order part of the agenda. Uh, next time, discussion and vote and act relative to the cost of living adjustments for retirees. Mr. Hearn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try to keep this short. The short version of it is that uh, legislation signed by the governor, Chapter 269 of the Acts of 2022, uh, gives the select board the authority to approve or disapprove of a uh, COLA increase that was previously voted on by the Arlington Contributory Retirement Board for fiscal year 2023 for basically all retirees. Um, if the board has any questions, I'll do my best to answer them from the perspective of the uh, legal side of it. but. Uh, the short version is, is that the local option that provided for uh, these increases by retirement boards was essentially amended to make sure that the select board of any given town or the mayor of any given city would have the ability to vote on it to approve it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. So I turn to my colleagues. Um, uh, move, move approval, and I have one question. Sure. <clears throat> Do I understand that also the retirement board has or will have to also vote on this, or is it just us? Correct, uh, uh, Mrs. Mahan. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, yes. The, the retirement board, uh, to my understanding, already voted on it. They already um, okay. But they have to approve it, and then it comes to you. Okay, so I'm assuming they did if it's yes. come to us. Okay, thank you. Move approval. Second. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Well, I'm going to ask a quick question, and maybe uh, Mr. Pooler can help with this. You know, so, uh, can, can someone just help me understand what's going on in years 20, 34, and 35? Mean, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may? Yes, please. Um, you have two schedules. Uh, a kind of before and after schedule of what the funding for the system would be based on the same assumptions of an annual 5.5% increase. And uh, essentially the difference between these two schedules is that if we move forward with uh, this funding, then by FY23, uh, uh, if we don't uh, fund this, uh, don't approve this, we would have to appropriate $24.9 million to the retirement fund. If we do approve this, it would be $26.3 million. Um, what's going on is there's an annual cost of about $170,000 that then plays out over time, gets amortized in the uh, retirement system. Um, so it, uh, it will affect how quickly we fully fund our retirement obligations. But if I may, 
and I think it is a reasonable thing to do given that this matches what Social Security is doing for uh, retirees under that system. Uh, and in my opinion, it's uh, fair and welcome for our retirees. Yeah, I mean, and this is more just for my edification, you know, basic stuff it means I don't have a problem with uh, uh, voting for this. So one of one of the basic questions. So the the net three agency payments, that sixty six four twelve number, that never changes. What does that represent? Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. it's something that's just baked into their funding schedule. It relates back to something that I would have to ask them. That's okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that, Mr. Mr. Buller. I, I forgot to talk about this earlier, so I just, uh, so anyways, uh, so it seems like, oh, Mr. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a question. I, I imagine the retirement board voted the 5%. The I know the legislation is up to 5 but just so we're clear what we're voting on to. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So on a motion to uh, uh, approve by Mrs. Mahan and a second by Mr. Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Dickens? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, moving on, so an update on the town manager search process. That's it. So we did our first round of interviews meeting last Thursday. It went very well. And, um, and we'll be doing our second round of interviews tomorrow uh, from 10 to 2. Uh, and, and so um, uh, I am sure we're not going to have any problems giving, um, uh, presenting, bringing forth me and, and at least three candidates. And uh, it's been a really good experience me and looking forward to tomorrow. I had told you all uh, that it would be likely that we would want to do the final interviews uh, with the board um, during the week of the 20th meeting. But uh, since then, I've talked with um, Bernie Lynch, me, and he told me he will need to do some more work. So it's likely that we wouldn't be able to um, do those interviews until the week of the um, 27th at the earliest. So I just wanted to let you know in case you were in clearing time out. Uh, we do the twentieth. So, so um, that's where we are. Uh, any questions, Mr. Helman? Mr. Chair, just to make sure I heard you correctly, uh, that went by kind of quick. Um, the so you the week of the twenty seventh is that activity by the screening committee, or would that be the first uh, potential work by the select board on the finalists? It, it'd be the first work by the select board on the finalists. Okay. And thank you. And um, at what point will we have enough chance to uh, talk with Mr. Uh, bring in Mr. Lynch and have a discussion about what kind of process the board as a, as a whole wants to lay out um, for evaluating the finalists? Because I, you know, so far we haven't done that. Yes, well, I, I would imagine that earliest that the board in total would do that would be at the meeting on the 27th. Uh, which is more amusing to think that we wouldn't be ready to go I mean, until um, sometime that week at the earliest. Thank you. Sure. And it, it may very well mean that he could provide an instruction set, but, but if we want to have uh, an instruction set and conversation with him, then that would have to take place in the context of a full board meeting. So that would be the night that we do it. It may be a program of meeting um, after that. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay. All right. I'll move it on. And uh, we're um, uh, in 15 discussion and vote overnight parking pilot. So, as I am um, providing the notes, I mean, uh, the, the point of this discussion now is to try to get a handle made on how much to charge uh, for the permits. And, uh, I had a conversation uh, by phone with some. Um, Mr. Heim, you know, just to get a sense of the, what really goes into determining the, the fee uh, and what could we do be, in order to have the cost of the permit reflect the um, concerns that we have about exploitation, for lack of a better word, being of, of the ability to do overnight parking. So, for instance, mean, uh, if one wanted to have more than one permit, you know, 
would it cost the same mean as one permit or could we you know, have a rationale a, a legal viable rationale for why that um, should cost more and um and so so mr heim i got the impression mr heim you know um, that there is a path towards that i mean uh, um it could potentially be challenged you know uh, um, and at some point, Mr. Hine, if you want to raise your hand and step in <laughs> and correct me or add more more um, flavor to things, you know, uh, or more tail, I, mean, I welcome you to do so. Uh, but but this is this is going to be the tough part. You know, how, how do how how do we price it? I mean, and as Mr. Mr. Hurd um, has emphasized, and I didn't really I mean, try to rework the title of it uh, because I didn't want it to seem as if I mean, we're trying to move. The, um, but they were trying to be evasive or, or, or in any way disingenuous. I mean, it is more about us being less restrictive I mean, um, with allowing overnight parking than it is about just opening up the system um, completely to anyone parking overnight. But what we do need to do, though, is come up with a way in which it is enforced, I mean, um, equally. You know, and so even though I and I think Mr. Corsi are viewing this process, I mean, of, of the rationale for doing this through an equity lens, I mean, uh, I mean still the, the, the permitting process has to be done, you know, in a way that treats everyone uh, equally. I mean, so, so I'm going to open this up for people's I mean, thoughts and feelings. And I do want to add that uh, we are going to have uh, another forum on the 16th, you know, uh, and I would say if more, if any of you other than Mr. Corsi and myself uh, want to attend, I'll be happy to make it you know, a special select board meeting you know, so that you could you know, attend and participate um, as much as you want. Uh, but, but I imagine that that one, you know, um, will we'll hear more, a lot more from our residents, especially since it's seeming, being, since we're coming to the end of the process, we're gonna make a decision one way or another. I think people are getting more engaged, I mean, and, and um, try and get some feedback, I mean, as to uh, pricing. Hopefully, and, um, by then, I mean, well, Mr. Corsi and I, so myself, can at least toss a number or two out there. If not, you know, we'll be engaging the residents for a number that they think would work being in one way or another. Um, so I'll stop there. I'll see if there are any comments or questions. Mr. Hurd. So this potential vote on the agenda here, are you looking for us to come up with a number tonight and vote on it? Well, yeah, I mean, as, as, as we have been voting so far, I mean, like, I mean, so we've pretty much been going around the horn just to see if people are in, in agreement in, with with something, you know. Is, so like, if I can ask, either the chair or the town manager, is the am I correct? That, is the lot permit still a dollar a day, three hundred sixty-five dollars a year? Yes, it is. It seems to me that that's the easiest and most efficient number to put on this permit, and I think it would make it. I think that there was issues that we had come up with where what do we do with is it fair for somebody that bought a year pass for a lot and I would hmm. this isn't really what's being asked of, of us but I would think that if somebody has a pass for a lot already we could just say all right you know transfer that fee to your for, for that can be absorbed as your pilot fee but I mean I think that's a good round number that we've used and it is twofold. It gives us money to fund the pilot, but also is we, we do want, I think residents have come out and shown that there's people for and against this. And, you know, we, we do want to make it so and we, that we need to do a little more education of the public because we even heard tonight multiple residents talk about lifting the parking ban, which is not what we're doing. It's just easing how we give these overnight per parking permits so we you know we again we need to educate the public on that and they'll I think they'll see that once it happens um, but I think that number provides our basis for you know it will for the people that need it are gonna 
be the ones that come and get the permits and not just everybody that I mean it's a big enough number that I think people that don't need it who just want to park in the street for convenience will be turned off by that figure and it will give us the most accurate results so I think as we kick numbers back and forth I would say three hundred sixty five dollars or however it's built I don't know if it's built monthly or yearly but the dollar a day figure seems like the most appropriate number to put on for the overnight parking permit thank you mr chair Thanks for Mr. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Chair. Were you going to make a comment? Well, yeah, I think. Well, yeah, I'll make a quick one, and I'll just say that you know. Um, so the analysis I did for the last meeting with respect to it and um, how who was paying for these, I mean, I found that about thirty percent I mean, were were making a case for why they I mean, did not would not pay, you know, that amount. You know, so I don't know if that ratio will hold up I mean, across town. I mean, but I think if it does come down to the fact that we can charge a fee that only reflects the cost of uh, running the program, I mean, with the understanding that a significant number may be discounted or, or, or not have to pay, I mean, it would potentially justify I mean, that higher cost. So that's it, Mr. Alvin. Oh, so Mr. Chair, may I? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, ha, since in the, in the two weeks since we last had a meeting, have we made any progress, Mr. Chair, or perhaps uh, Mr. Town Manager, if, if you wish, um, in ascertaining or estimating what the co administration cost of this program would be? I'm not. You know, so it's, it's really going to be a function, I think, of, of how many people and utilize it, you know, I mean, we're certainly going to have the staff capacity uh, to do it. And, and so we could you know, just, I guess, determine you know, how much time that person is dedicating to it and apply I mean, mm -hmm. a portion of their salary uh, to the cost. I mean, um, uh, the, the other part would be enforcement. And, and I could um, ask the town manager to uh, work with I mean, the chief to get a sense of how much more enforcement would have to be done. You know, but those are the only two costs I can think of at this point. We're not going to be doing. You know, um, we're not going to be putting up any signs, and so you know, that wouldn't factor in uh, to the pilot costs. Whether that would factor into the cost long term, I can't say. Um, Mr. Kohler, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've not tried to look at the costs, partly at, because of a conversation that Doug and I got to this afternoon about whether we need to look at this as a fee that uh, whose costs we need to justify by providing the backup, or whether this, in fact, is a license um, that mm -hmm. we can charge for. The, the town council can explain that in more detail if necessary uh, but uh, it's a sell essentially selling something that the town owns or has uh, that uh, for what basically whatever fee we want to charge um, and so in that regard one I don't know that we need to then figure out what it costs Two, if there are additional incremental costs um, and we are collecting this fee, the only way to recoup those costs and apply them would be to amend whatever budget. So for example, if uh, Office X were administering these passes, giving them out and so forth, and there was a cost to do that, and that office needed an extra $1,000 to be able to do that, we would have to ask town meeting to amend the budget that's now been presented in this book by $1,000 and say that the offset to that is this fee income or license income, as the case may be. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe the uh, attorney Hyde may have something to add with your, with your permission? Yes, 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 please. Thank you. Thank you. Just to add a little context to what the manager was referencing. So generally speaking, when we talk about uh, fee structure for some kind of service, we're sort of talking about some statutorily empowered ability that the town has to charge a fee, and that fee has to have some reasonable and rational relationship to how much it costs 
for the town to provide that. That's sort of the baseline. And um, there are some tweaks on that that might, uh, that the chair, Mr. Diggins, and I discussed, which might be, you know, let's say you have parking that costs a certain amount of money um, per the first two permits, uh, but there might be an additional cost uh, associated with your third and fourth and fifth permit because there might be things that start to come into play when you start talking about folks uh, using a service so much that collectively, if you don't sort of artificially suppress demand, the town takes on additional costs it wouldn't have taken on otherwise. This is sometimes called like congestion pricing in certain places, uh, like New York City has that. I believe Boston has entertained the notion of uh, a permit fee for parking that gets higher as you have more cars. Town manager, clever person that he is, also um, talked about a sort of separate way of thinking about it that I had not really thought about before, which is whether or not we're, we might are, are alternatively phrase this as more of a license to use a public good rather than a permit fee system. I'll admit that I don't know off the top of my head based on the recency of that conversation uh, how we would have to structure that in order to consider it more of a license for a public good rather than a, a fee for um, specific service. Um, so that's a, a sort of wrinkle on it that I have to consider sort of independently and what might have to be the parameters of a parking program that's considered more of a license rather than a permit. So again, you know, traditionally we've thought about these things more as like, okay, what does it cost to make sure that you've got an enforcement person to go out there and get stickers and put on cars or whatever. Um, but if you were thinking about it in a different way, I suppose, as long as it would pass legal muster, um, uh, there's not a reason that we can't do it. I just have to yeah. dig in a little bit to figure out whether something that's a little bit more novel might be feasible. And I'll, be, I'll also be candid with the board. I frankly don't know, nor, do I, nor am I 100% confident that all cities and towns have sat around and thought, we have this parking uh, permit cost because we're following parking permit fees under the Emerson case versus we're doing it because it's the way we've done it. Parking meters are governed by a different statutory authority and have a little bit more uniform regula regulation from municipality and municipality. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. It uh, is an illuminating discussion. I think it is not inconsistent with some of the comments by my colleague, Mr. Hurd. If I were to venture to guess, I think that the, the, the fee for the town parking lot, probably not based on an estimation of a cost to the town, but is in, in fact the town selling something, a piece of something that it owns. Um, what I like about this concept is that it is it resonates with some of the f input we've received from the public, which is that the overnight parking or the parking in the streets are a public asset that, that the town, you know, by the residents of the town corporately own. Um, and I think that in consideration for use of that asset, a fee is, is reasonable. I like the idea of a fee being enough that it is used, uh, as Mr. Hurd suggested, by people who uh, have, have a strong need for it. And I think we, we certainly need to think carefully through that lens of, of, of equity that Mr. Uh, Diggins mentioned. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that's appealing to me particularly for a, a pilot. And I, and I find myself kind of warming to the idea of really thinking about this as not necessarily changing the overnight parking ban, but, but changing the, uh, the, the uh, tools that we have to allow people, as we do now, to park overnight. So I think this has been interesting and helpful to me. Uh, I'm glad to hear about the public forum, which I think is in about 10 days if I've got my calendar right. A suggestion and a request I would make to those running the forum is that I think that we will get better public feedback the more uh, prepared we are to present scenarios of what this could look like with respect to operations um, and, and potential costs. But I would also, just to echo something I said at our last meeting, it's really important to me that if we are doing this as a pilot program, that we'll be able to describe it and defend it as a pilot program. And to me, that means really being explicit to ourselves and with the public what we want to learn, how we will evaluate success or failure, what we intend to do uh, as a result of how we learn and, and, how, and, and how we learn those things. So uh, 
I think that's really important for me as, as I consider potentially voting on this, that we have clarity about that. And I think that that would, being able to describe that to the public would also <coughs> increase the quality of the public feedback that we get that I want to hear uh, before I'd be prepared to vote. But this has been helpful, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Anyone else? Well, with respect to what you want, Mr. Thomas, I understand. I mean, and, and, and look, I, I would love to be able to construct a study I mean, that could give you like conclusive results. That would be very hard to do. I mean, uh, uh, you'd have to come up with some control. You'd have to probably run the experiment. Me for a long time me for us to be able to answer me, um, me I think those kind of definitive questions that would say whether this worked or not I mean it's like is it oh, what we'll be looking at the number of complaints me mean me, how many people are now parking me um, or use, utilizing overnight parking me or are they doing it because of the the experiment that we're running or are they doing it because conditions have changed I me mean, just so it would be just nearly impossible to control for everything you need to control for for me to end up with a study that would be convincing to me you know so i have said from the beginning I me mean, i see the pilot as informing us of how to get to the place we want to be uh which is to allow um to to allow us to have more permitted parking for those who need it. You know, uh, it, it, interestingly, I mean, I guess because the universe runs on irony, we haven't had anyone come to this select board meeting, you know, lately saying, look, I really need, you know, uh, uh, overnight permit parking. But it used to be you know, something that we would see, I would say, you know, uh, once or twice a year. I mean, it's been, and, and so, but you don't know what demand there is underneath that. I mean, people just aren't coming because they know they're not going to get it. You know, certainly in the survey that we did, you know, uh, for the before the first forum, and even the forum, I mean, there were people who were making a case for why they needed I mean, and and in some of the links that I provided, I mean, there were um, studies that show that the I mean, people who I mean, uh, who low, who have low income, I me mean, are the ones I me mean, who really need their cars, you know, and. And to the extent now that he, we are putting another burden on them I mean, to, to get to their job who's far away or further away or not accessible by transit, I think we are doing them a uh, disservice. I mean, and so I would like to try to remove that. And so for me, it isn't a pilot to say I mean, whether we do this or not. It's really a pilot to inform us as to how we do it. I mean, it's so, so the information that I'm looking for is like, I mean, what happens to I me? Mean, I mean, do we see a lot of overnight parking? A lot of people, uh, the APD are saying this is this is a problem. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean, I I just can't. I don't want to lead you to think that I can give you I me mean, some kind of metric. I mean that you're going to find satisfying because I don't think I can come up with one that I'm going to find satisfying. So really, it's a matter of helping us get from point A to point B given that point B is where we want to be. So I guess really what we're going to try to decide is that is that is that point B where we want to be and what is the nature? First off, do we want to get to a point B and what is it like? You know, did that make sense, Mr. Helmans? Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Um, I am not asking for a randomized controlled trial. I think that a qualitative study is, is plenty good, and that's all you can get with this. So that's that kind of pilot I have in mind. But I think you have identified something that is important for, for us to have clarity amongst ourselves and with the public. Is this, a, is this a pilot that will help us decide whether to make changes permanent and whether to do it or not? Would we potentially roll them back? Um, that's, that's been my assumption up, in, up until just a few seconds ago, actually, is that what I, I was thinking that this would really be a trial uh, and that kind of pilot. And I think uh, you're articulating a, a different idea of what a pilot could be, um, and, and I think that's a legitimate idea. But that is a new dimension of this that I think we really need to be clear about with ourselves and with the public about what we intend to do, including including Thursday night. So, um, so it's new information for me to think about, and I, I appreciate that further articulation. 
And if I could add to the, the, the clear intent, I mean, uh, is to stop the uh, before winter time. And I understand the argument that the winter is a different kind of task. I mean, but essentially, the the the, the risks the, we think I mean, um, during winter are high enough. I mean that that it would be a problem if we had too much marking. I mean that we really want to stop and see how people are utilizing this ability. I mean, uh, I mean we're getting a lot of demand for it, and we're getting a lot of cars on on the street. You know then we need to have a conversation with DPW and APD I mean, whether or not I mean, this is something we want to continue uh, during the winter. I mean, uh, we're assuming that we, we won't want to continue during this during winter at this point and that we stop and then, and then just evaluate. You know? So that's why we're saying we're just likely to stop in you know, November and December. You know? and so if you consider that a rollback, it would be a rollback. You know? um, but, but if there's low utilization, you know, and APD and DPW said, say, well, we see what happens. We would take that into consideration and come back to the board in total and have make a decision, you know, as whether or not we continue. So, so I have to say. Yeah, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I, I want to thank Mr. Hurd for putting out the number because that I think that gives us now, um, we had talked about different aspects of a pilot, and now that is something to get feedback on mm -hmm. at the forum. And, and I think the intent remains clear that we'd like to, to start this in May, and it will continue for more than one season. It won't just be the summer. It would go into the fall. and. And we want to receive feedback on it, but now we have the elements laid out for feedback and for going forward. And I think clearly there needs to be some more dialogue uh, with Mr. Pooler and Attorney Heim on, on some of the um, aspects of the, of, the, of the fee structure, whether it's a license, whether it's a fee. But I think this, this moves us forward and puts us in a decent position to receive more feedback and, and again, knowing that the goal is to do something in May, but we may receive some feedback and, and change some things, but at least now we have the structure, uh, mm -hmm. if, if we have a vote on this tonight, of, of what the, the various components, and that's the one remaining item that you had left on, on the memo that you sent to us. So I mean, I think it gives us a decent structure to go forward and, and to receive more input from the public. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other comments? Questions? Well, Mr. Corsi, we're going to have to draw straws and see who creates that PowerPoint. So, 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 uh, so I, I guess the, you know, I'll figure out by when I need to know me how many uh, of you are going to attend the, the meeting so that we can um, publicize it as either just a forum or a special ed court meeting. Okay. And if, if we know right now that uh, there are three, then we can go ahead and uh, publicize it as a special select board meeting. No. Oh, Mr. Mr. Helmuth? I, I plan to attend. Okay, so then there we go. We have three. No, great. Thank you. And, uh, so, all righty. I think we can move on at this point. You know, no more comments or questions. All right. So, The next item is a vote on the community equity audit report. And so, so we have it in front of us, you know, and essentially we're just going to vote to uh, receive it tonight. You know, as you know, we have a forum scheduled for the 13th, we, uh, uh, where this will be presented in full, and we will be take you know, this take lots of comments being from, from residents. You know, uh, and so uh, this will also be a situation where if we know that three of us want to attend, it will be uh, declared a special select board meeting. You know, and if there are three of us that want to uh, attend uh, and we want to hold the, uh, the actual receipt of the report, the, until then, uh, we can do that. Otherwise, we can go ahead and just officially receive it now and then have that full presentation you know, on, on Monday. 
So move, move receipt. Second. Uh, I'll, I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion to move receipt. I don't think I got it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a race. <laughs> so, so. All right. Well, you gave it to Mr. Hurd, you know, um, Mahan, so he gets to. Can chatty yeah. Kathy on the record. <laughs> And Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Chair, just for my benefit, uh, frankly, but also for the public, uh, could could someone provide the de the complete details or the, the time and the place of the um, of the forum? Just, I think you said the 13th. I assume that's a week from today. Yes, a week from today. You know, and this is going to be hybrid. You know, and the physical location is going to be at the community center, and it will run from 6:30 to 8 o'clock. You know, <clears throat> terrific. And, so I, I, do, a, I do plan to attend if that informs your uh, decision about. Excellent. Great. So it will be a special flight like coordinator. You know, so happy to have you and anyone else. You know, so. so there, sorry, yeah. just so we're clear, there's three members going to that? Mm -hmm. More than three, at least? No. Oh, um, three would constitute a special meeting. So yeah, that's yeah, what you're just saying. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's funny. So it's just two at this point. So do we have a third? I'm sorry. I was just thinking that there's an automatic two. I was thinking, Mr. Course, he's just accompanying me everything, everything. So I was just like, <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, <laughs> so, so, so we only have two at this point. You know, do we have a third? I could follow that well, up with the board after the meeting, mm. if that's more, if that's helpful. Okay, right, right. And, and if you're not sure, you know, then we can just advertise this as a special life board meeting. And, and um, if, 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 <coughs> Turns out that we don't have three then uh, it's, it won't be me. But at least at this point, we will have uh, received it and officially. So, all right. Thank you. So, um, any questions, comments on the report? All right. So, uh, motion to receive by Mr. Hurd and second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. <clears throat> Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. So, moving on, item number 17, a vote on the select board administrator. So, um, this is Malloy, uh, and I um, conducted an uh, interview of two candidates, you know, two internal candidates. And, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great experience uh, uh, because you realize me and the talent that exists uh, here in town, you know, and in, in some respects the decision was difficult, and in other respects it was an easy decision, you know, and, and um, we did decide to go with um, Mrs. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Meyer. <laughs> Mrs. Meyer. <laughs> so, 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 so. Married to the job uh, now, that's what you got. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and so, so I want to um, welcome her, I mean, as the uh, new board administrator. Assuming we get a vote in a second, you know, so. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Ms. Um, Mahan. I do want to thank you and uh, Ms. Malloy for um, overseeing this process and as well as the both of you um, giving each member of the board the opportunity to express um, their thoughts as well as keeping us informed of the process. Um, I've been through this, let's see. I did not Mr. Pitcher, but Mr. Dunlap, Ms. Cove, who is now Ms. Malloy, Mrs. Kropelka. Um, so uh, in, of all the times myself going through that, because I'm the old one, um, this has been uh, the most informative process. Uh, speaking nothing, no reflection on, on the previous um, board administrators, or I think it was executive something when Mr. Dunlap was here. So with that, I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve um, Ms. Marr, Ashley Marr, as our new board administrator. And I, I do want to thank her for um, <clears throat> really filling in, in this role for several years now. Um, and it's pretty much been seamless, um, you know, having you here, as well as um, working with the office and office mm -hmm. staff um, and as I said to you before, there's been several times I've gone to pick up the phone to call Marie, Mrs. Kropelka, um, and this would have been one of the nights going home in the parking lot because I know uh, one of the last conversations I had with her 
was how highly she thought of you and um, put, putting the personal, um, how much you and the rest of the office were there for her on a personal level, but certainly I uh, had a very serious conversation with her regarding um, her position and moving forward and she had nothing but glowing um, kudos uh, to you. So thank you, Ms. Marr. Thank you. Sorry, I can't call you Marie. Um, but I'll talk to you in my head all the way home. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Mr. Mr. Hurd? I'll second the motion and just say that this was an excellent choice, easy choice. And Mrs. Mahan just talked about this, but Ms. Mar has, re I think a lot of people don't know, if, and if you're not on this board, that you're not going to know how much Ashley has done over the past couple of years with some transitions in that office. Um, how it got done, I don't know. The, it's a secret that only you'll know, but it certainly has been a heavy burden to bear. So I think we're in good hands. And I just wonder if we get invited to have tea in your living rooms as well. <laughs> on a periodic basis. I'll get the pink chair over. <laughs> so, but for anyone that didn't know, that was a nod to our former administrator. Um, but again, happy to support this and welcome. Mr. Scorsese. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I, did, I want to thank you and Ms. Malloy for conducting the search, and as Mrs. Mahan said, for, for keeping us informed. Um, I want to congratulate Ms. Marr and, and, and thank her again. We did, the other members have, have said it, but these past few years, we were understaffed in, in the um, Select Board Office, and, and you really stepped up. And I, I just saw it since I've been on the board in 2019, how you've grown on the job, how you've taken more initiative and, and done things where there, a lot of days it wasn't there, somebody there to help you and you figured it out and we really appreciate that and, and uh, appreciate everything you've done um, these past few years and, and uh, want to congratulate you uh, at, when, once we take the vote here on the appointment. Thank you. Mr. Helm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in addition to all the fine comments that my colleagues have said, uh, I want to acknowledge my appreciation for your dedication, Ms. Marr. It's not been an easy couple of years. Um, and you've demonstrated the kind of commitment to uh, high quality public service and responsiveness that we need in the office. And you know, you're someone who always says yes when I have a question or a need quickly and, and thoroughly. And um, I look forward to many years of that and more as we go. Thank you. Congratulations. I'll just add, because I did get to conduct an interview with me. Um, I was really impressed me, you know, with, with your responses to uh, uh, a pretty pretty um, tough interview that Mrs. Malloy put together uh, for, for folks. You know, and it's very clear that this is a job uh, that, that you want and that you can do it. And, uh, and I did not have that conversation that Mrs. Mahan had with Mrs. Kapal Kapuri, uh, because I was afraid to. And I didn't want Marie to think me that he, he, I was just afraid to. I, 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 yeah, I couldn't get myself to have that, that conversation. So it's good to know that that's what she felt. I had that impression uh, because of the way that he, Karen, that she communicated with Ashley long after she stopped communicating with me. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that indicated uh, a certain confidence in the relationship that she had. And we all know that uh, if Marie didn't respect you, I mean, she wasn't going to interact with you. I mean, and so just the fact that she did you know, meant a lot um, in terms of how much she valued and respected um, uh, Ms. Meyer. So on a uh, motion to approve the Appointment by Mrs. Mahan and second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hahn? Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Hellman. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. <clears throat> yes. It's a unanimous vote. Congratulations. Congratulations. So we now move to our second open forum. And uh, so um, uh, do we have any hands? J just so, oh, did I take the vote for a future select ordinance before open forum? Oh, did I skip that item? Sorry, did I skip that? 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I did. Sorry about that. I have to do it. I have to do it at least once a meeting, right? You know, it's not even that I'm in a rush. You know, so uh, so future like board meetings. You know, so uh, so our next one is on the 21st. The I am thinking. You know, uh, I think we should just book out uh, the Mondays in March. I mean, and if we finish early, finish early. You know, uh, maybe we won't need the the 20th. You know, uh, but I mean, I certainly do the six. And 13th, I mean, uh, um, plan on the um, 27th. But I'd like to, I'd say reserve the 20th just in case. So um, it's not. Is there, um, we're all set for the February meeting, so we're doing March, right? I just want to. Yeah. Okay, and um, what I wanted to say was um, could we possibly. Um, nailed down three days just where I believe we have 19 citizen I will note that we have 10 of the 19 on the agenda for next Monday oh you do not next I'm sorry the 27 so there will be 10 of the 19 that we've received on that meeting okay well how about if um, the chair has proposed two Mondays and um, <clears throat> if we do need a well, I'll leave it at that. I'm, I'm thinking we may need a third meeting in March. I don't know if people kind of want to um, I'm thinking uh, well. get a sense of is it a, another Monday or is it a Wednesday or something else. So, um, uh -huh. I guess I wasn't clear when I said look out March. I just meant like we should just like assume every Monday in March. I mean, uh, I mean and, and maybe if we are fortunate, we won't need the 20th, you know, but, but I was just reserved every Monday. I mean, if we finish early, you know, then, then we. Drop, drop the, the 20th and 27th. And, but, um, and I just want to add to it wasn't my idea to put 10 <laughs> resolutions on the 27th. I got, I was advised to be that we could do it, you know, and so we're going to give it a try, you know. So, but um, we, we'll, we'll see what happens with that agenda because I'm seeing some other things coming, so we'll, we'll see, you know. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. So can we just run down what the what the dates are? In March? Yes, please. Yeah, there's 16th, 20th, I mean 16th, 13th, 20th, 27th. So every Monday, 6th, 13th, 6th, 13th, 20th, 27th. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, Same um, as in February, right? Is that on? Mr. Chair, um, what I'd like to do is actually continue what we've been doing is um, I will endeavor myself to look at 10 citizen warrant articles, look at them and have a conversation with you um, about sometimes I can sort of get a good estimate in terms of um, how long that will take. My, my only thing is um, I'm going to um, have to remain firm just for family reasons to try to stick to that 11 o'clock rule as much as possible. Oh. Plus, my brain just starts to, I'm already wandering, and it's what, maybe a little after 10? Yeah. Okay, a little after. So. I can set the schedule. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, I don't want to, I'm going to look at the, the 10 citizen warrant articles that are scheduled, and then I'll have a conversation with you because I'd, 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 I'd feel really um, concerned that if we could only get through five to seven for those three sitting around and we didn't get to them and they have to come back. So uh, if you, uh, the chair and I do discuss the agenda, every agenda beforehand anyways, but I will make it a point to come down, come down to the office, look at them, and then um, if we can get 10 done in one night with all the other regular business, um, that's great, but I also know we have the owl wife on. So it may not be 10. I think that's a little ambitious, but I'll, I'll have a conversation with the chair and it'll be his call in the end. Thank you. Yes, well, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Thomas. And then, and then Mr. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe Attorney High may have wanted to make a comment on that. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to note uh, for the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to note for the board that um, Ms. Moore and I discussed, and, and the resident petition articles this year are very heavy on resolutions. Um, so a good number of them are resolutions. A good number of other ones are about formations of study groups or committees. I think there's only three articles that actually propose a bylaw amendment that are resident petition articles. So 
for what it's worth, that informs the board's consideration and schedule. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, resolution, and we have at least one or two articles where the same person filed multiple articles that are sort of related together. So, for your consideration, and I'm sure as Ms. Mahan says that you know you guys will sit in and walk out, and if it doesn't, if that's too many, uh, let me. I'm happy to yeah, work with whatever you guys want to do. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Um, I want to second Mr. Mahan's request to observe the 11 o'clock deadline. I think I, I suggest that really be a consensus, if not a formal board policy. Um, and I, you know, I leave that to others to know exactly how that works. But I think uh, if we at least have a clear idea that that's what we want to do, and we can have that discussion. Uh, my view of this would be do the best we can with scheduling the agenda items, and we'll get to what we get to. You know, and. If things need to spill over, that, that's how it works in any other board meeting. So we do, we do try to get it done, but I think that hard stop is good for the quality of the discussion. I think it's also respectful of the public's uh, time and those participating in the hearings as well. I appreciate Can that. I, well, I, I, Mr. Chair, to that, yes, yes. Um, I don't think that is codified. Mm -hmm. Just informal. Because uh, I know when I first got on the board, <laughs> believe it or not, you'll be shocked. Um, I remember leaving here, if I got out at 12, 1230, I was a happy camper. Um, we, we would go after 1 a.m. But that was a different time and different board, and that's a true story. So, because um, I used to want to stop, but it didn't. So, um, perhaps moving forward, whether it's an update it's in the to Selectman's handbook, because we have to take a vote every time we Is it past. in the Selectman's handbook? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. good. That, that's yeah. good. All right. Yeah. I missed that. Okay. As was pointed out to me when I was chair and had a <laughs> hearing until 12.30. You see that? <laughs> I, I was going to say the two chairs before Mr. Diggins had some trouble with the 11 o'clock film. <laughs> being one of them. I, 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 do re, I do recall there was, that we were asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there was no dictatorial. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm taking it that Mr. Naimi understands me uh, and that he, he wouldn't put 10 on if he didn't think we could cover them in a reasonable amount of time. The only concern is that there may be things coming up on the agenda that he's not aware of, and so that may make it um, impossible for us to cover everything. And what I try to keep, I try to keep meetings to three hours and 15 minutes, you know, 10.30 to all the time when you know, I began to, to lose it. And that's one of the reasons that, he, as you notice, we don't tend to have long presentations. And, and in the case of the equity audit, I asked to have that on a separate night to really give it me a lot of time uh, rather than, than rushing in because I am one that would prefer to have more frequent and shorter meetings mean than, than longer meetings, especially if we're going to do deliberations you know, towards the end of our meeting. So, so you're not going to get any problems with me with setting it down at 11 o'clock because I hope that we're done long before then. You know, so, so, um, so then, I mean, are we okay with the, the 6th to 13th? You know, just look out all the Mondays and hopefully we won't need the 20th. I mean, so we, we'll plan on the 6th and 13th. I mean, we'll see how we're doing, but at least we will have reserved the 20th, you know, and, and definitely the 27th, because that'll be the last one before the election. And are we okay with that? I didn't hear you, Ms. Martin. Oh, it's okay. Are you going to schedule meetings into April as well? Oh, I guess most of them. I guess we, we schedule that that first that first Monday after the election. I mean, so the, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we we should go beyond that, right? Or do right, we, no, we, no, yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, we right. we have to meet by law to at least organize. So that's right. what April third. Is that April what? 3rd. What's the yeah. first Monday in that's April? Right. Third. April third. Third. Yeah. All righty. So I think we're set there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now. Now, the second open forum, you know, do we have anyone that wants to talk with us? If they would just like to raise their hand at this time. Okay, um, yeah, Steve Ward, Constantine, but and, 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 and Adam Oster. Yep. <coughs> okay. All right, so we're going to lock it down with those three, you know, and then we're going to clock.
Thank you. So, um, Steve Morton. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear loud and clearly. Okay, great. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Okay. Hey, my name is Steve Ward. I live here in Arlington Center. I'm coming back for one last attempt to bring the board's attention to a seriously flawed and corrupt candidate selection process for the tenant member of the board of directors at the Arlington Housing Authority. The Housing Authority, Arlington Housing Authority, represents close to $60 million of public taxpayer money with a $4.5 million annual operating budget. The oversight is supposed to be handled by the Board of Directors. When we have a corrupt op uh, program for candidate selection, which was never prescribed by the state law that created that member, Everybody participated, including you, when you selected a 23-year-old person to, who's been in the country for eight years to represent 500 people who are elderly and disabled. Forgive for going all that. What we have to do is I have contacted the Department of Housing and Community Development. I've contacted every member of the board here of selection. I've contacted the director of the Housing Authority, and I've contacted the chairman of the board of directors. I've contacted Garbali, and I've contacted Frieden. Garbali said that he would handle it. I've, and that was over two years ago. I've never heard a word back. I've tried to contact him. I get nothing. The Department of Housing and Community Development insists that this is an issue that has to be dealt with by the legislature to define how those candidates are selected. Otherwise, you are standing the potential of facing as many as 30 candidates for you to review. I know that is not what you're looking forward to, and what you did the last time was you forced six of them to quit. You ended up with six people in, and selected one. We have to, I'm soliciting your participation in this because it's a serious business. The oversight of the housing authority is absolutely necessary. It is an element that has been neglected for years and years. Very few people know anything about the housing authority, including some of the people who are working there. We need to get this done, and I'm soliciting your attention and, and your gravitas in persuading Garbali and Frieden to get this done by the legislature. We've got a year and a half to do it. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your participation. Mr. Diggins is more than familiar with who I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Um, if Constantine just wants to unmute their mic, you are next. Hello and good evening. Um, I'm ready to start. Thank you. Um, my name is Constantine Platanik and I live in, uh, in East Arlington. Uh, earlier during the meeting, you've mentioned that you haven't had a lot of people come in and sort of uh, provide their opinion on the in favor of lifting the parking ban. Uh, I've been following this really closely. Um, you know, I have my in-laws come um, a couple of days a week to help us watch the kids and they have to park on the street because our driveway is full and it is um, not a pleasant process to go request a parking waiver and there's been a number of times where even though I requested the waiver somebody came by and still gave me a ticket I have to submit um, a form saying this ticket was issued in error eventually the, the ticket gets rejected um, I can't imagine that it, that is a process that doesn't cost any money so um, I think there is all the reasons to sort of have this pilot. I think the fee suggested is relatively reasonable, at least 
uh, for somebody in my position, I, I can afford to pay it, especially if that would allow somebody with lower income to have a reduced fee. Um, and, um, you know, I don't think this city is going to turn into a madness where, where we're going to be parked bumper, bumper to bumper and, and hanging over people's driveways. I, I think that's not going to happen. Um, that's it. I just wanted to say that I've been following the process closely and I am very much in favor of the pilot. I hope it goes through. Um, you can have the remaining of my time. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker is Adam Oster. When you're ready, just unmute your mic. Am I up? Yes. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairperson, and congratulations to the board for being meeting in person. I wish I could. I wish I could join you. It just didn't work out tonight. Uh, and I just wanted to say a few brief words about bus service. Um, I spent some time digging into the new schedules that the MBTA put forward, along with the new routes uh, that I think we all know about. And I was really interested in what they meant. For Arlington, because although there's a lot of information from the T, it doesn't really answer that question in a straightforward way. It turns out uh, that there's a 20% reduction in the number of trips to the red line from Arlington compared to the schedule we had in 2019 before all the cuts came from, uh, from COVID and, and the fallout from that. And uh, the counts that that is based on are in a report that I've shared with the board. Um, and I just wanted to make a couple of notes. Um, I didn't evaluate the entire plan, the entire map. I didn't even evaluate the entire impact on Arlington, but I thought the red line trips uh, were pretty important to people. And that's why I focused on that. Um, bus transportation is key to many town goals for housing and sustainability. Uh, Maybe if there were better bus service, parking wouldn't be quite so tight. Um, given that the T says it's increasing bus service by 25%, this is concerning to me. And I, I just wanted to share uh, what I had learned. Um, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so that closes out our second open forum. And with that, we move on to correspondence received. And, and as um, Adam Oster mentioned, um, it is the new bus service report by him. And, um, and the other um, correspondence is on traffic concerns on Great Avenue by Shauna and Kristen Marquis on 87 Gray Street. So I turn to my colleagues. I'm Mr. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move receipts and referral of the traffic concerns to the TAC, the Traffic Advisory Committee, um, and the MBT bus service report, for which I am very grateful, by the way, uh, to the town manager for his consideration. It's, uh, as it relates to any action he, he may choose to, to take in communicating with our um, legislative delegation or other state officials. And Ms. Mahan? Um, I will second that and I will just let my colleagues know um, the board, actually my colleagues probably already know, the board has received other correspondence on the, on the Gray Street issue, um, but they didn't make it in time as we all know. So they'll appear as correspondence received on the next agenda. And I have a memory that one of the um, residents uh, cited that she previously served on one of our town committees um, and it had something to do and I'm, I'm not remembering it right whether it was transportation or disability or accessibility or something like that so um, it, when we get to that next agenda we can just mirror the same um, action we've taken now so thank you and I'll second Mr. Helmut's motion I think it had to do with creating like an age-friendly you know, community, you know, so, so I'm not sure what committee that was, but it was the, um, it was went into the, uh, helping Arlington become recognized as an age-friendly community, oh, okay. you know, so, um, 
Did you? Yes, I saw a hand motion there, Mr. Corsi. Was that to say something or? No, that, that was just to fix my hair. <laughs> <laughs> right. Is that me right. doing rabbit ears behind you, maybe? It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> so, so, all righty. So, on a uh, motion to uh, receive and refer, you know, um, uh, by Mr. Helmets and a second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. And so. All righty, folks. It's 1020. Can I get a motion to adjourn? You gonna do new business? Oh, oh sorry. I'm rushing through it again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, so um, I'll do business up. Uh, Mrs. Meyer? Ms. Meyer. You're married already again. <laughs> yeah, I have no new business. Thank you. Mr. Hein? Uh, two very quick things um, for the board. Uh, one, I just want to say thank you to those residents who checked in with the town council's office prior to submission of their warrant articles. The board requests this. We do it for a reason to try to get the matters in a posture before the select board finance committee and uh, zoning uh, Arlington redevelopment board so that the substance of what folks want to do is the primary focus rather than some procedural defects. Uh, we didn't actually have a great um, uh, participation in that part of the process this year and unfortunately there'll be a few hiccups because of that but I want to say thank you to the, all the folks who did uh, take the opportunity to check in with me so I could try to get their warrant articles in the best shape as possible. Mm -hmm. um, secondly I wanted to let the board know that I'll be out the 21st to the 24th um, the school vacation week if you will. Uh, Deputy Town Council Mike Cunningham will be back uh, in the office that Thursday so if there's any questions that obviously the manager or the board has, uh, Attorney Cunningham will be available that Thursday and Friday. But I'll try to wrap up any business that we know is going to be on the agenda in advance to make sure you have all your supporting reference material by the end of next week. Thank you. Mr. Cole. Just two things. Uh, one, I th I've sent notice to the board already, but I just want to t say to the public that we have hired a new uh, deputy <coughs> town manager. His name is Alex McGee, he is the current uh, finance director for the town of Hamilton. He's also worked uh, for many years in the uh, city manager's office, at DPW and IT departments in the city of Lowell. Um, and he will start on March 6th and I will have him introduced to the board at that time. The second thing I just want to mention is I have spoken to our planning director and have asked her to communicate uh, with the redevelopment board to ask them to consider moving all zoning articles to the fall town meeting. Um, they are considering that. Um, they may have a couple that would be um, consent agenda if we have a consent agenda this spring, but I think it's important, one, um, to give the planning department some flexibility. Uh, they're still somewhat understaffed and they have a lot of important things they need to take on. I think it would be better if they took on zoning at town meeting in the fall. Um, I also think that um, we need to do a better job in town of having zoning articles presented to town meeting with some structure, i.e. Uh, how they affect things like either uh, affordable housing or business development. Um, and I did not see that in the 12 articles that were on the agenda now. They, they may in fact relate that way, but I think it's important for town meeting to have some structure that way. Um, so um, <coughs> I have made that request. I believe the uh, redevelopment board is considering that tonight, um, and I hope that they go along with that suggestion. So I, mean, I guess I have a question uh, to, to Mr. Hyde. So, so then what is the process by which that happens because that's going to be a special town meeting so so then for for any residents that then submitted in a zoning related article how do we make that shift over to um mr chair if i may i'm just going to be very careful here because this isn't posted on the agenda okay. uh, but it's kind of a relatively straightforward thing in terms of the ARB, the ARB can sort of withdraw its articles, postpone them. With respect to any resident petition articles, the ARB couldn't do that without their consent. It would have to be on their consent with some sort of uh, pledge to bring those articles back, which we have done in at least one occasion recently um, 
because of uh, the timing of um, some of the pandemic related things and the ability to have a more full throated discussion at a later point in time. Thank you. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, one thing, and, and Mrs. Mahan referred to it, but I did this was going to be my new business, the just acknowledging the number of letters that we had received with concerns on, on Gray Street. And I know we made the referral and they'll, the letters will be um, on the next agenda, but I'm very familiar with that intersection at Churchill and, and Gray because it, walking from Monotomy Rocks Park, if you go from Monotomy Rocks down to towards Mass Ave, that's where you cross and it is a dangerous intersection both in both directions and, and the cars are coming up Gray Street. I, I find that that can be um, just as dangerous because you're as you're going across. So we had talked previously and we appreciate all the work that tech has done. But, um, you know, at some point I would still like to see if there would be a way to get some sort of inventory from tech in terms of what's being worked on and, and maybe get a sense of priorities because this this feels like a priority to me um, based <coughs> on what we heard and just just based on what we've seen thank you welcome Ms. Mahan? no new business thank you mr. chair mr. Helmuth? thank you mr. chair um, I also was going to bring up the the general uh, issue of the Gray Street I think we've all received a, a good half dozen emails and they've all made a lot of really good points um, in, a, in addition to um, other points that have been made. I think for me, as a question of new business and a, a direction of future discussion with the town manager and with the board, I would like to, I think that might be time to re-examine the question of uh, engineering-based solutions, including the potential for, you know, what we used to call speed bumps. I mean, there are speed tables, there are a lot of other, uh, other more gradual things. And I don't know if that's the right solution for this uh, site, I have no idea. Um, but I do know that other communities are using um, engineering solutions like this for safety and um, just in, in, not in, only in response to this near miss incident but other things that I've heard. Uh, I think in my two years on the board I've heard more from residents about traffic safety and pedestrian safety than any other single issue with the possible exception of town meeting reprecincting. So I, I would urge us to just keep in mind of all things being on the table. It's a complicated discussion, um, both in terms of capital budget and public sentiment about it. Um, but, um, but this has certainly redrawn my attention to that. So I'm glad to hear some, some noise about that tonight. Thanks for coming, Mr. Hurd. No, no business. Thank you, man. I have no new business. I'll just stay in my defense, though, with respect to the uh, missing things on the agenda. I am trying to do this be uh, paperless when I'm here, you know, so, but I've also tried to facilitate you know, the movement of the meeting, so I've actually added my, my phone into the process. I'll, I'll get this all worked out, but then my chair will be over. Uh, so anyways, thank you for your patience, as I sometimes have these little hiccups. And so um, with that, I think it's time to ask for a motion to adjourn by Mr. Hurd. We have it in a second. Second. Uh, by Mr. Corsi. So my motion is adjourned by Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Corsi, Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mr. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Yeah, I'm so fast. <laughs> fast is better than worse. I'm going to try to keep you.